Good morning. My name is Janice Lewis George, and I am the Ward 4 Council Member and Chair of the Council's Committee on Facilities and Family Services. The time is 924 a.m., and today is Thursday, April 6. We are holding this hearing on the Zoom online platform. In addition to Zoom, this hearing is being broadcast live on my website at JaniceWard4.com backslash live. Here are some brief reminders about the Zoom platform and the committee's protocol for witnesses participating today. Thank you again to our witnesses for taking time to speak with us today. All witnesses participating in this webinar are currently listed as attendees. When it's your turn to join a panel for testimony, I will call your name and a member of my staff will promote you to panelists. If you wish to activate your video while you testify, you need to click the button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Representatives of bona fide organizations will be given five minutes to testify. Unaffiliated public witnesses will be given three minutes to testify. And when your time is up, I will ask that you will please conclude your remarks so that we can stay on schedule. We will be calling up witnesses in panels of four or five witnesses and council members present will have 10 minutes to ask each panel questions. If you have any technical issues during the hearing, Please notify my staff either via the Q&A function on Zoom or by sending an email to facilities at dccouncil.gov. Witnesses are reminded to please send a written copy of their remarks to facilities at dccouncil.gov so that it may be included in, in our documents. All testimony and pre-hearing documents are available on my website at janiceworkforcom uh, backslash Dropbox. The re record for this hearing closes in five business days at 5 p.m. on Thursday, April 13th. First up, today we are holding the public witness portion of our annual budget hearing for the Department of General Services, better known as DGS. We will hear from government witnesses later today at 3 p.m. The mission of DGS is to build, maintain, and sustain the District of Columbia's real estate portfolio, which includes all DCPS, DPR, and other municipal facilities in the city. The proposed fiscal year 2024 budget for DGS includes a nearly 12% increase over fiscal year 23 approved levels to 431 million in operating funds. In last month's performance oversight hearing, I laid out my four main priorities for DGS this year, improve response times for non-emergency work orders, ensure DGS holds its contractors accountable for quality work, improve transparency and linkages to the public, and improve the energy efficiency of our government buildings. Today's budget hearing allows us to hear from the public about what they like and don't like in the mayor's proposed budget. It also provides us with the opportunity to examine how well DGS is prepared to execute on its roles and responsibilities in the coming year. I'm pleased to see that the proposed budget includes a nearly 8 million enhancement in the budget for school maintenance, something we've heard a lot about from members of the public and school staff. Today, I'll dig into this number to ensure it's being spent wisely and with a strategic plan to reduce wait times for open work orders. The committee sent pre-hearing questions to DGS earlier last month, and their responses are posted on my website at JaniceWard4.com forward slash drop, Dropbox. We also sent a full list of follow-up questions earlier this week to ensure today's hearing is productive and moves along smoothly. We appreciate DGS support and collaboration amidst, amidst their leadership transition. I see that I am joined by Council Member Zachary Parker. Uh, Council Member Parker, I'll recognize you now for an opening statement if you have one. I tend to skip these statements, but I, I just want to underscore the importance of getting things right with DGS. As you mentioned, uh, Chairperson Lewis George, I too am uh, hardened to see additional investments uh, within the agency, namely for preventative maintenance and care at our facilities uh, and assets across the district. I imagine much of what we're gonna hear from residents across uh, or in today's hearing uh, center on delays um, and ongoing concerns with upkeep of the district's assets. These are concerns that I know you share um, and that we've been uh, following up and pursuing uh, with the agency. Um, and I look forward to digging in with our government witnesses later this afternoon. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from our public witnesses. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Zachary Parker, who is a member of this committee uh, and continues to do great work in collaboration with us. Uh, 
First up, we have Joy Taylor, public witness, uh, ANC Commissioner 4D04. CC, I'm gonna call you, she says CC. <laughs> So that I'll so I'll get the first and last name wrong. Uh, Tisha Cockrell, uh, president of the Friends Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center. Robert Oliver, public witness, and Sabrina Rhodes, uh, community organizer for Empower DC. All right, I see Joy Taylor. Good morning, Joy. I just need you to unmute. I think if you press the space bar, it'll also unmute if you can't find the unmute button. There you go, perfect. Can you hear, me? oh, good. You can hear me now? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, thank you also. Uh, I'm sorry, are you, can you hear me now? Okay, now, now I can hear you again. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Council Member Parker, for taking the time to hear me also. I'm calling to see if you would please add an additional $5 million to your budget to spend on a new athletic facility for Easter. Now, we know that right now, I believe after working with uh, DGS and other uh, um, other agencies, that the problem is is that when a work order is asked for, it is asked for specifically that problem. The problem is actually various different problems within the work order, but that work order can only turn a screw. It can't unturn a screw. It can't um, put oil on the screw. It can't do anything else except for that particular issue. So the hope is, is that we can look at looking at work orders that do additional problems in addition to what that work order actually says. Um, so therefore we're looking for a open work order for $5 million to build a facility at Eastern specifically for athletics. As you may know, um, Eastern is the home of the Turkey Bowl, which is the largest athletic program in the District of Columbia, which celebrates the, I'm sorry, the um, athletic competition for football between the two District of Columbia um, athlete, uh, athletic uh, football programs. And so, ooh, I'm sorry, I just now see that we're at 34 minutes, uh, 34 seconds. I also would like to ask for the District of Columbia to be able to um, host sponsorships which right now we cannot do under District of Columbia law, but we're the only uh, district in the nation that has such a law. And that we also make sure that DOEE and DOE, DOH report for maintenance after the maintenance program is completed. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, next up, we have Tisha Cockrell, president of the Friends of Briggs LaSalle Recreation Center. Good morning, Tisha. Good morning, Councilwoman Lewis George and uh, uh, Council Member Zachary Parker and all that are with us today. My name is Tisha Cockrell and I'm the president of the Friends of Briggs LaSalle Recreation Center. And we are partnered with DC Department of Parks and Recs. And we work together with site director Shalita Settles and the staff at our community rec center. So I'll just go straight into 
um, our outdoor and indoor recreation center issues. I was uh, testifying with the uh, committee for uh, DPR yesterday, and I listened to the entire thing. So I heard <laughs> what's going on with the roof uh, at Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center. I'm disappointed. However, I use this today as this opportunity to make sure that we are in the number for fiscal, fiscal year 2024. Um, excuse me, I'm also in my office trying to put out fires. So um, uh, that we're uh, in the budget for fiscal year 2024, along with Tacoma, and that we also uh, will uh, get the roof fixed during that time. So I guess I'll, I'll be staying on a little longer to make sure that that happens. So with that, in that regard, we'll move forward to the other items that um, are on my list. Um, as Dr. Uh, or Director Hunter says, I have quite a list, yes. <laughs> so um, the uh, netting, the repair of the netting on the fence, when um, they kick the ball, the ball's rolling out uh, of the hole onto the street, that's reportedly on hold for procurement April 2023. I don't know what that means. I was told it was completed, but then uh, individuals from your office, Mr. Uh, Will Perkins, I believe, um, and the spreadsheet he sent to me said it was reportedly on hold for procurement. I'd like to know what that means. Um, addressing field lighting. Um, I see uh, it said reportedly approved for completion April 2023. Outdoor fitness equipment on the grassy area. I'm hoping to include that in, I saw in DPR's fiscal year ready to play budget that there was additional funds in that fiscal year. I'm hoping that the new environmentally uh, environmental friendly turf field with the walking track and the um, equipment on the grassy area would be a consideration for fiscal year 2025. Um, the doors, I, 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 uh, the lock, the cylinder lock, I saw that that was completed. Um, splash Park, uh, the outdoor splash park, there's been water pressure issues, excuse me. <clears throat> I like to make sure that that's rectified um, the new playground, we're thankful for the new playground, but of course there's the sunshade issue, it's really hot out there in the summer, uh, seems like it's going to be especially hot, so we appreciate that. There was a um, request to bring back outdoor garden uh, between the school and the old playground. I see the school has an outdoor garden, so um, that's another request. So uh, on to indoor issues, um, again, uh, the basketball realm that was stuck, uh, it was reportedly uh, approved for completion, but I don't know what that means. Um, the HVAC system, there was supposed to be a new HVAC system. Um, I saw more requests for being too hot, being too cold. So I wanted to make sure, was there really an HVAC replacement <laughs> or uh, is there just been some patches? Um, and then there's regular cosmetics, um, window shades in the multi-purpose room, aluminum blinds. Uh, the blinds are really un uh, unattractive, let me use that word. Um, there's a repaint uh, request for the building interior, um, replace windows for the multi-purpose room. There's been replacement of windows in other rooms, but I didn't see any no mention of those with that room. New fitness equipment is on the way in progress, but we have no idea if that's gonna uh, be now or a next fiscal year. Um, and then there's ping pong table requests. And then there's the lottery process for the allotment of summer camp. And um, that's all for me. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you. I will have some questions at the end. Um, next up, we have Sabrina Rhodes. Good, Good morning. morning, Sabrina. Good morning, Chairwoman Lewis George and Councilmember Parker. Good morning to all the witnesses here. Um, I'm the community organizer here in Abbey City and also the ANC Commissioner 5D02. Uh, I want to first bring to your attention about Cremel. Uh, as everyone knows, the mayor put another 15 million in the budget for Cremel. DGS is in charge of the project. Uh, under the RFP, we have yet to know who the architect is. And we have had a community meeting with DPR and DGS, but the, the project is supposed to start this spring. Not sure early spring or late spring, but there's still no, no architect 
on the RFP or a general contractor. Also, um, we know that Cremel is a DPR site, but there was a trailer that was on the site that had burnt, that had was burnt up. We had intended on using that trail on the site, which uh, the previous the previous organization, the Union Station, they put the trailer there for uh, the project that they were going to do that they couldn't do. So the trailer had been sitting there since 2013. Um, about a about a month, a month and a half ago, two months ago, it was on fire. It's still there. Half of the trailer is burnt to smithereens and it's still sitting there. Nobody has touched this trailer at all until we started getting momentum and getting Cremel worked on. Also, um, we, you know, we're having meetings with DGS. Uh, the project manager is Brent Cisco on the DPR and the project manager with DGS is Diego Martinez. We need to have more community engagement with Diego Martinez and DGS. Um, we, we as a community are in, deeply involved in the renovation of Cremel and we would like to help with the design and know what's going on as far as the design is concerned with the architect. DPR is communicating with us all the time is the issue with DGS. Also, um, there's, I'm not sure if DGS is responsible for cleaning the site, but we have a lot of glass on the site. Um, we have two basketball courts and a, and a playground. And there's a lot of broken glass on the grounds of the part of the site that we're allowed to go on. Where the fire was, was on the side of the site that we're, that's fenced off. We don't know what happened and it's undetermined. Also, we want to add that 1601 W Street, uh, we're involved with the Brentwood community with the Aussie bus terminal that's proposed to be there. And um, uh, there's the, as, as you should know, the community is opposed to this project and they have been doing after hours work. And I need to know why is DGS allowing the contractors to work at one in the morning, two in the morning? Um, that shouldn't be so. There are there is a community there. There are homes across the street from where this site is being worked on. There's dust flying all over the place, and there's no protection against the dust coming into the community and coming where the homes are across the street. Um, I just, I just need for some, some action from DGS, some positive action, uh, this Cremel, yes, we are for, we are with, <laughs> and we are excited. We yeah. just, we just need DGS to, to cooperate. We need the glass. We're going to get ready to have a pop-up library in April, uh, yeah, this month on the 25th, okay. D, uh, DCPL is gonna bring the pop-up library to the site. But if, and I know my time has ran out, but in order for the daycares and children to, mm -hmm. to be able to be on this site without being harmed, yeah. we need the area to be cleaned up. Awesome. Well, th thank you for your testimony and, and myself or Councilman Parker may have some questions for you when we get to the question period. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Robert Oliver. Good morning, Robert. I can see you, but it looks like you may need to unmute. 
Yeah, the sound, your sound's not coming in. Oh, okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Good, good, fantastic guy. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't hold things up. So let me start by saying good morning to everyone. And I want to say that it is an honor to testify before Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis George, the Committee on Facilities and Family Services, and invited guests, including Council Member Parker. Uh, I just want to add that my name is Robert T. Oliver, and I represent the Lamont Riggs Citizens Association Development Task Force. Our current task is to convert green space located at the intersection of South Dakota Avenue and Riggs Road Northeast into a viable park for our diverse and growing community. The green space was created when DDOT reconfigured the intersection of Riggs Road and South Dakota Avenue Northeast by removing the traffic ramps from and to eastbound Riggs Road to further development goals. The result was the creation of a 1.5 acre green space currently owned by DDOT and maintained by DGS. The Lamont Riggs community and the Development Task Force have worked to convert this area into usable parkland. Our major accomplishments are LRCA initiated a small area plan that the DC Office of Planning completed in 2008. It was approved by the DC Council in 2009, and it was incorporated into the DC Comprehensive Plan in uh, 2021. Lastly, on September 24, 2022, a site experience event was hosted on the site to solicit community input via survey that was later published on the LRCA website. Um, we thank um, Council Member Zach, Ward 5 Council Member Zachary Parker for including the Parkland request into his budget letter to the mayor. We also thank the mayor for responding to that request. We also thank Council Member Janice Lewis George for her enthusiastic response to our letter of support to the Ready to Play survey sponsored by DPR. Um, however, more work needs to be done. First, we request that the ownership of the green space be transferred from DDOT to DPR. We understand that DGS has the authority to do so. Uh, next, and uh, lastly, uh, I'd like to ask each of you to protect the funding that the mayor has in her proposed fiscal year 24 budget that supports this project. And I just want to again say, Thank you both for the work you have done. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, that's the end of my testimony. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, and I appreciate your advocacy and work. Um, and uh, Councilmember Parker and I are both enthusiastic about this. Uh, we cannot wait. We're in the early stage, but we can't wait. There's going to be a great ribbon cutting there. And it's going to be wonderful with both of us, as well as the LRCA. Uh, present. Um, and so we will be doing some follow up to make sure this this goes through. So thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to check one more time to see if Commissioner uh, Croissant Courtney's from 4D04 is here. If not, we're going to move to the question uh, section for this panel. Okay, I don't see them. So uh, I'm going to move to the question section. Councilman Parker, um, because you you have two Ward 5 residents here, I'm going to let you go first uh, on the questions, and then I'll ask any follow-up that's necessary um, for in my question section. Thank you. Uh, some of this may be more editorial than a uh, question, but Mr. Oliver, it is great to hear from you. I don't quite see you, um, and as was mentioned, I really appreciate your advocacy. Just a few point, uh, updates. we I did get confirmation from DGS and I'm looking forward to following up with them in today's hearing uh, just on that transfer memo. So they they did commit to writing it and submitting it. I believe they've already submitted it. Uh, we need a copy of it. Uh, I can say I've worked closely with uh, Councilwoman Lewis George on this. 
Uh, I'm the new kid on the block, and uh, we are excited to just work together to get this done. Uh, but shout out to you all on the ground and residents who have been pushing for this for more than a decade. It should not take this long. Um, but as you mentioned, really excited that the mayor has uh, met this request with an investment. And so what we're going to also do as we go through this budget is ensure that we protect that money. Uh, so that we can uh, ensure that a park will be implemented in the next fiscal year. So uh, thank you for all your advocacy and work. Uh, but if you could just relay the message, DGS has committed to submitting that transfer memo. And they last communication I heard, they were writing it that week. Um, I have yet to get the copy of it. And that is what I'll be requesting from DGS today. Uh, Commissioner Rhodes, similarly, thank you for your ongoing advocacy. Uh, I would say I'm going to have my team personally reach out just around some of the issues that you highlighted. Um, and I'm really um, interested in getting more clarity from DGS around the work happening at the bus terminal in Brentwood, uh, the 1601 uh, W Street. For those that may be watching and may not know, uh, we have received numerous requests, uh, not requests, complaints rather, uh, as well as video footage of work happening at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Um, and it is not just from one neighbor. It is from multiple neighbors in that community. Um, I have committed um, with my team to doing random pop-ups at the site to just observe what is happening. Uh, but I do want clarity from DGS around what is happening there and why are we allowing um, neighbors to be disturbed at all hours of the night. Um, again, at, at, as it relates to the issues at the Cremel site, I will have my team follow up. Uh, Ms. Cockrell, thank you for your testimony. Uh, it, is, it seemed like you had your long list of things. And so again, not quite a question. Uh, although I did um, take note of your, your push for clarification around what it means to be on hold for procurement. That's something that I'll push to get clarity on from DGS. Um, as you know, procurement continues to be an issue uh, in the city, um, and, and, and we will seek to get an answer for you. And Ms. Taylor, thank you for joining in your testimony as well. So uh, not, not so many questions, but just wanted to repeat back some of the things I heard um, and to give you all updates based on uh, where things stand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman Parker. Uh, Ms. Taylor, I, I do want to come to you. Um, thank you, and uh, which for Eastern High School, which is now in Ward Seven after redistricting, I was going to say Ward Six, but it is now Ward Seven. Um, uh, thank you for raising your concerns related to the Eastern High School field. Um, I got to attend the turn uh, to attend the Turkey Bowl this year with Councilmember Parker, um, in which you know my team won, um, and agree <laughs> <laughs> that the field <laughs> needs some help. Um, and so we're going to be asking some questions of DGS regarding Eastern High School field. I agree, you all are way past due uh, a field that uh, is, is operational works and uh, has been a place for, um, you know, so many of our turkey bowls and other games and, and for the students, um, no matter what sport they play, to be able to utilize that field. Um, uh, our staff has been in contact with uh, your State Board of Education member. Uh, as well around this issue. So I appreciate you raising it. I want you to know that we are raising this issue as well. Um, and we wanna be able to, to support uh, in that regard. Um, and if there's any, and, and always feel free to give give my my team here, the committee uh, email or call um, as well to, to, to be able to work with you all. And congratulations on Eastern just celebrating an anniversary, I believe. Yes. Uh, Yes, they celebrated their hundredth, and I'm really proud of them too, even though I didn't attend. But the issue, well, just to let you know, thank goodness, um, Eastern is going to get a football field. It's already slated and everything. The issue really is more so everything around the football field. You know, once you put in a new football field, you got to clean up everything around it. Mm, everything, it. you know, they need a eight more, a lane track in order to have professional um, competition. You know, they need to be able to have a football stadium that people aren't falling out of. There is mm. so much around 
the around it, got season. you. And that's why we're asking for the unlimited five million so that we could do every, you know, the bathrooms need to be fixed. Okay, okay. The concession stands need to be installed. There's so much around the field that needs to be done that just getting the football field isn't enough. And that's why we're asking for the amount, but we're also asking for the ability to raise the funds so that we're not always asking for money, that we're also raising the money and doing everything so that we're not just begging we're also giving and that is i think the difference between what eastern is asking for than anybody else that if the district of columbia is able to accept the sponsorships and the various other funds that people want to give to the district of columbia because you know just with dunbar high school that's how i got the budget i got the budget from dunbar high school but dunbar high school is the greenest school in the world people world and so getting that budget from eastern trying to figure out how to build the greenest school in the world in front of an area that has the best um what i would like to call oh, yeah. area for getting sponsorship because we're right in front of a uh rfk before it gets built that's right right okay. in <clears throat> right in front of a uh a hotel excuse me not a hotel a apartment building that needs to be has residents right yeah. in front of this that and the other that it could actually sustain the type of um sponsorship that we need okay. in order to make a change um okay. And so that's why we're asking not just for money, but the ability to raise money and not just for now, for long term. Right. For long term. Or actually forever. Thank you for that detail. If we I really appreciate that. If we're doing it correctly, because you know, there is a lot of money that can be made. And I want to specify that the best money is the money that we get from the people that we're paying. That's how we're going to know if the various different things that we're purchasing are actually good and effective. Yeah. You know, okay. do the well, kids... We're going we're gonna to follow up. I will follow up um, with DGS on that um, question of sponsorship and and what that could look like. And I agree, you all are in a very viable location. Um, Ms. Cockrell, uh, who's president of Friends of Riggs LaSalle, thank you again for your detailed testimony. Uh, we'll review these with DGS and Director Hunter, who I know is very familiar with these issues. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned about the roof issue, which we uh, found out about yesterday um, and discussed yesterday with Director Hunter. So uh, we we will have some follow up uh, after after uh, hearings uh, finish to figure out the the roofing issue particularly. Um, so I want to thank this entire panel for uh, their testimony. Uh, we will be following up on those issue uh, these issues uh, with with DGS um, and and Ms. Rhodes especially. I that two in the morning, three in the morning, ten o'clock at night, unacceptable. So thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have Jeff Gilbert, the organizing director for the Beloved Community Incubator. We have Zainab Kamara, Raina Sosa, Eloisa Diaz, right. good morning, Jeff. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Lewis George, and, and thanks to the committee for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Jeff Gilbert. I'm the Legal and Technical Assistance Director at Beloved Community Incubator. 
I organized with street vendors, uh, part of Vendors United, Vendedores Unidos, um, testifying to ask that the Committee on Facilities and Family Services and the Department of General Services consider committing part of the parking garage at DC USA Mall toward community benefit in the form of support for low cost storage space for local street vendors. To develop DC USA Mall in the early 2000s, the district provided significant subsidies to New York based grid properties and Gotham Organization Inc, including tax breaks and other direct financial support, like continued city ownership of the facility's parking garage, which was essential to the initial financing for the project. The DC USA Mall parking garage, the construction of which was financed by $46.9 million uh, tax increment finance bond issued by the DC government, has been severely underutilized since it was completed in 2008. In 2008, the DC government entered into a covenant regarding the use of the parking garage, whereby DGS is responsible for contracting for day-to-day -day management of the garage. However, the covenant restricts use of the garage to only parking spaces that serve the retail tenants in DC USA Mall, and the covenant can only be changed by a unanimous decision of DGS, Grid Properties, the owner of DC USA Mall, and Target, the anchor tenant of DC USA Mall. In exchange for city support for the the development of DC USA Mall back in 2000 and the early 2000s, the owner grid properties agreed to provide certain community benefits, including making available retail space inside the mall at a discount to local and minority owned businesses. We want to ask if the council or the mayor has any record of any community benefits provided. Uh, we haven't been able to get information about that. We also ask that DGS act to transition use of portions of the garage toward uses that could benefit the surrounding community, including the creation of low cost storage space for local street vendors. Uh, DC USA Mall is right at the center of the highest uh, activity vending area in Columbia Heights. It's a huge foot traffic area right in front of the mall. Given the high cost of rent in the district, street vendors face significant storage challenges. Storage bills cost vendors hundreds, if not thousands of dollars each month, and vendors must travel significant distances at the start and end of each day between the storage units they're able to access, also sometimes uh, to and from their home where they store supplies, um, and their vending spots on 14th Street in front of the DC USA Mall. There are at least 40 or 50 vendors with Vendedores Unidos, Vendors United, who vend in Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant, some of whom who you will hear from in just a minute. I hear from basically every vendor in the area stories a great hardship related to the cost of storage and the difficulty of moving supplies multiple times each day uh, between faraway places. So we ask just that DGS work with local street vendors to create low cost storage space in the under underutilized DC USA mall parking garage. And we wanna make ourselves available as a resource in any way uh, to engage with the owner of DC USA mall, to engage with Target, uh, to try to see if we can find a solution. And Eloisa and Reina are both currently vending. So I'm actually gonna call them. I've been in communication with them and they will just testify right through my phone uh, to the committee. So one moment and I'm gonna call Eloisa first. Okay, good. Okay, I have Eloisa here. Can you all hear us? Yes. Hi, Eloisa. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I am a vendor in, in Columbia High, and um, I live in the wall four. I am um I I concerned to see if he, I, we can find help to uh, renting the parking lot on Columbia High because I carry my merchandise. I am not drive and I know how I help to carry my merchandise every day to Columbia High. I take all my truck on the Metro Rio. Mm -hmm. I make six trip around six trip, three to go and three to come back. I'm 62 years old and I desperately need help. 
to see if he, the council in the world, world for can support in me and a lot of people who need to rent in where reasonable price, the parking lot, to weekend storage stuff in Columbia High. I need it supported, please, desperately. That needs some help. It's a way to again come with you, Council. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that testimony. Good day, everybody. You too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eloisa. Thank you, Jeff. Bye bye. Okay, I'm going to call Raina Sosa now. One second. Okay, Reina, estamos en la reunión ahora. Uh, puedes hablar aquí sí. con el, el comité del consejo. Sí. sí. Buenos días. Eh, mi Buenos días. Es... Sí. Y yo soy vendedora en la calle 14. Entonces, en esta mañana, eh, yo les quiero pedir que por favor eh, nos ayuden para que nosotros podamos tener un lugar donde almacenar nuestras cosas que nosotros llevamos. Porque para nosotros es bien difícil poder, poder este, llevar nuestras cosas y luego las mesas no tenemos donde guardarlas. Y estar llevando y trayendo para nosotros es bien difícil. El día de ayer, por ejemplo, yo tuve un incidente con las mesas y casi me quebré un dedo por estar bajando y subiendo. Y otra de las cosas también que nosotros hemos recibido tickets por parte de la policía por estar bajando nuestras mesas y subiendo. Entonces, yo quiero pedirles, ya que yo, yo tengo entendido que este edificio es del gobierno, entonces por eso estamos recurriendo a ustedes para que nos permitan poder usar este espacio para nosotros los vendedores, porque lo necesitamos, necesitamos mucho un, un espacio, por favor. Ok, mil gracias, Reina. Ok, muchas gracias okay. por escuchar, gracias. Adiós, buen día. Okay. Thank you. Um, and just checking, uh, was Zeneb Kamara with you all as well? Zeneb can't make it this morning. Okay, yeah. totally fine. All we right, had well, a, um, a big week passing the law on Tuesday, so our, our capacity right. is low for, for direct accompaniment. That's right. Congratulations to you all. We are very, 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 Thank very you. happy and excited with that. One thing I'll just add about what Raina said, one thing that Raina was mentioning, I'm not sure if you all were able to understand, is just that um, having to unload her supplies on the street. So like to bring them, bring a truck and unload them there makes her extra vulnerable to being targeted by the police. And we've decriminalized vending. It, it will be effective soon, but police have, have different parking enforcement authorities. So it's, it's another way that vendors can remain vulnerable. And she got a ticket last week or the week before for just stopping for a couple of minutes to unload her supplies right on the side of the road. So that's what she was talking about with with the the big big money ticket she got recently. Ah, uh, got it. Okay, thank you, thank you for that clarification. You mentioned in your testimony that any changes to the garage's usage must be un, a unanimous decision of DGS grid properties and Target. Um, I just want to know, sort of, have you all already talked to any of these entities, and um, what if so, what, what what was their response thus far? We haven't been able to get in touch with good properties. They, okay. you know, they're they're a big development company, so they don't respond to our requests. But we okay. would love to to work with with the committee, work with DGS to get in touch. Okay. Something that we have heard, and this is just from working with Councilmember Nadeau's office when Councilmember Nadeau was the chairperson of this committee or mm -hmm. the committee that that oversaw DGS. 
what we heard is that Target was interested in possibly changing uh, like the space use agreement during the pandemic in order to do curbside pickup inside uh, the parking garage. So there might be desire to, to renegotiate uh, the terms okay. of the covenant a little bit. We're not 100% sure, but you know, it's, it's an underutilized space. So we'd love to work with all stakeholders to find right. a way to better utilize the space. And, and were you all talking when you, you said there were, was there a community benefits agreement previously? Good question. I would love to just ask that of the committee. If you, you all can use your ability to determine. Find out if there was a community brief. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen, we haven't been able to track down any of like the official documentation about it. We've only okay. been able to track down uh, media reports at the time. But, okay. you know, there was a, a huge investment from the city in, in developing That's right. Developing this mall and especially, you know, like the financing was basically going to fall through at the last minute if the city didn't continue to own the parking garage, which the owner didn't want to own. So we, we really, you know, the city provided a, a ton, a ton of support to this developer to build the mall. So we want right. to see whatever kind of community benefit can be obtained as, as possible. Okay. And you also exit DGS to convert the garage into low cost storage space. We, we haven't asked them yet, no, but we'd love to, to work with the committee or any way you can put us in touch with them. Um, we'd, okay. we'd love to, to do that work as well. Okay, I, I, uh, I absolutely, our, our, we, my committee and I will work with, uh, with you um, and, and organizers and uh, uh, vendors on the ground to, to see what we can make happen and, and to locate some of that, those historical documents. Um, before I move to the next panel, I just wanna ask my colleague, Councilor Parker, if you have any questions? You covered it, um, okay, okay. but there are some follow-up points um, that that we need to make, and I'm That's sure right. we'll 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 do so later this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Um, in the next panel, we have Charles Berger, Chair, Eastern Market Community Advisory Committee. Uh, Monty Edwards, Chair of the Capital Improvement Subcommittee of the Eastern Market Community Advisory Committee. Neil Flanagan, Archives Advisory Group of the Council of the District of Columbia, uh, and Bill Rice. Charles, I, I, I see Yes, you. I'm, uh, okay. There we go, <laughs> thank you. Great. Good morning, Mr. Berger. A long time no see. Yes. But still very much good to see you. <laughs> and uh, you also had your new position. Thank Definitely. you. Thank you so much. Um, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Lewis George. And I uh, would like to uh, also welcome Councilmember Parker. My name is Chuck Berger, and I am before you today as the chair of the Eastern Market Advisory Committee. First, I'd like to thank your committee for this opportunity to speak today. And MCAC looks forward to working with you and your committee to ensure the continued success of the Eastern Market and Eastern Market Special District. In 1999, legislation was established by the DC Council creating the current structure by which Eastern Market would be managed, regulated, financed, and improved. It placed the market under the jurisdiction of DGS and created the Eastern Market Community Advisory Committee, uh, which is called MCAG, and a unique partnership to advise DGS about the operation, management, budget, and capital improvements for Eastern Market. Eastern Market is an advisory group governed by DC legislation and regulations that represents the interest of Eastern Market community and the district. MCAC consists of representatives from elected or duly appointed representatives from the ANC 6B, Office of the Mayor, Ward 6 Council Member, Eastern Market Merchants and Vendors, and a Community Representative, CHAMPS, which is our local Chamber of Commerce, CHRS, Capitol Hill Restoration Society, Capitol Hill Village, and an elected Community Representative. Within our responsibilities, MCAC utilizes three committees, Tenants Council, Operations, and Capital Improvements. These committees have proven to be tremendous value in our successful working relationship with DGS to the benefit of the market and to the best interests of the district. We are here today under one of MCAC's most important legislated responsibilities, which is to provide our recommendations during this annual budget review. 
This particular budget is critically important to the maintenance, safety, and preservation of the market. This budget has a direct impact on market operation and thus its ability to continue to serve as a major economic engine and historic cultural asset for the district. This is only highlighted by Easter Market's 150th anniversary year celebration, which you'll both be invited to many functions we have coming up over the course of the next year, celebrating the fact that we're one of the district's largest non-government local and tourist destinations. With me today is our chair for the Capital Improvements Committee, Mr. Monty Edwards. As dictated by legislation, we are required to review and comment on the yearly budget. As I have stated, we view this as one of our most critical responsibilities. We have worked tirelessly with DGS in providing budget recommendations that are fiscally responsible, insightful, and cost-effective. In this light, we will put our request forward today. In closing, I would like to thank DGS and Barry Margison, our market manager, in building this effective relationship with MCAC as first envisioned in the legislation. And I just have to add personally, uh, I know this may embarrass him, but I would most like to publicly thank Mr. Edwards who will be speaking in recognition of over 20 years of volunteer service to the success of the market in MCAG. Much of what we have achieved today is solely due to his contributions. And thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I will have some questions afterwards. Uh, Surely. Um, next up, we have Monty Edwards, uh, Chair of the Capital Improvement Subcommittee of the Eastern Market, Eastern Market Community Advisory Committee. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, Committee Chair uh, Lewis George and Council Member Parker. I am Chair of the Capital Improvement Subcommittee of MCAC. The DGS budget now before Council for Eastern Market Capital Improvements only provides $660,667 with zero for FY 2025, zero for FY 2026, zero for 2027, zero for 2028, and zero for 2029 but Eastern Markets capital requirements for fiscal year 24 through 29 is $1,723,475. That's less than the original DGS budget request of 2.4 million. Thus, Eastern Market requires an additional $1,062,880 over the 660,667 currently in the budget before the council so that Eastern Market can continue to operate successfully into the future. MCAC is mindful that beginning in 2024, DC is projected to experience a significant drop in revenues from commercial real estate taxes and an end to federal stimulus and COVID funding. Therefore, MCAC has examined DGS Eastern Market budget submission of $2.4 million for FY 2024 through 29 and identified projects that are less critical and can be deferred and only included in our proposal today the most critical projects. The proposed 2024 through 2029 budget contain projects that were approved as part of the 2022 budget and earlier, but have not been accomplished. Also, funding needs have changed. In this context, we're proposing a minimal but necessary budget requirement of $1.7 million rather than the original DGS request of $2.4 million for fiscal year 24 through fiscal year 29. The most important change included in this budget adjustment is the determination that the HVAC project, which council provided money for in the last two fiscal years, will cost over $800,000 in 2022 budget, more than the current HVAC contract provides for. The additional con 
um, cost is for the replacement of fan, pump, and valve controllers. In the current HVAC project, the contractor, Cinevas Southlands, has replaced all the controllers that have failed, but has also identified other controllers not included in the current project that are nearing the end of their service life and should be replaced over the next few years. I've attached to my testimony the letter from Cinevas Southland explaining this need. Preemptive replacement of these controllers is essential to ensure the continued operation of the new HVAC system. And it is a new system. It's supposed to be started the 24th of this month. When it, but the need for these and the schedule of replacement can't be determined until the HVCA system is started this summer. They will not have to be uh, replaced all at once and the, the, thus the cost can be spread over two year, years. Uh, we are proposing fiscal year uh, 24 and 25. $660,000 and $312,500 respectively, reflecting contingencies and inflation. The farmer's line electrical outlets are used frequently and sometimes roughly weekend after weekend by Eastern market small business vendors and require replacement. But this work can be done in FY26 for 217,000. In FY27, the market must focus on brick replacement and regrouting, replacement of the basement stairs and other small projects at a cost of some $91,476 as recommended in the facilities conditions assessment report. In fiscal year FY28, the FCA calls for replacement of two hot water pumps for $54,000 and FY29 requires regrouting of the exterior bricks. To repeat, the estimated cost of these Eastern market capital requirements for FY24 through 29 is $1.72345 million dollars as detailed in the attached spreadsheet. The cost is less than the original DGS budget request of 2.4 million. Thus, Eastern Market requires an additional $1,062,880 above the $663,667 currently in the budget before council so that Eastern Market can continue to operate successfully into the future. I thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we'll have some questions at the end of this panel. Uh, next up, I wanna to go to Neil Flanagan, uh, Archives Advisory Group. Good thank morning, Neil. Can you hear me, everyone hear me? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Chairperson Lewis George, and I'm glad to see uh, Councilmember Parker here as well. Um, my name is Neil Flanagan. I'm testifying on behalf of the Archives Advisory Group of the District of Columbia, of the Council of the District of Columbia. Our mandate, as outlined in the Fiscal Year 2021 Budget Support Act of 2020, is to advise the Council of the District of Columbia about Project AB102C in the District's Capital Improvement Plan to construct a new archives facility for the District of Columbia. FY24 is a critical year for the construction of the new archives facility at the University of the District of Columbia. The $30 million provided by the mayor and the FY 2023 supplementary budget, B25 is very welcome. The funding addresses cost inflation occurred over the years of delay since the original appropriations in 2015. Securing that funding is essential to giving the district's most comprehensive historic resource the dignity it deserves and bringing that history to the people of the District of Columbia. Yesterday, the design team led by Hartman Cox Architects presented the latest iterations of the proposed building. We felt they showed significant improvement of the design released in January 2023. Similarly, we believe the discussion led to several productive adjustments. There are many decisions still to be made in the design process, so we look forward to these future discussions. But this is a substantial investment, and we believe the best return on that commitment will only be realized by better and more responsive management by the Department of General Services. 
In the Budget Support Act, we recommend that the council direct DGS to improve its execution of the project in the following ways. <clears throat> First, a building that opens in 2026 should be designed with a level of sustainability expected in that year. This means a net zero design that complies with the Greener Government Buildings Act of 2023 and the spirit of the DC Clean Energy Act of 2022. Recognizing budget constraints, we recommend that the council mandate a design that maximizes on-site power generation. Similarly, we recommend that the council ask DGS and OPR to explore passive climate control techniques. To its credit, the current design is all electric and gas free. In short, we think that the best use of these capital funds is a building that not only showcases DC's hit rich history, but that showcases DC's values and our commitment to environmental sustainability. Second, the building was built on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia, literally on top of its parking garage. Consequently, multiple agencies, including DGS, will need to sign a memorandum of agreement that assigns rights and restrictions to all parties. DGS has not been forthcoming about this process, and we have not seen any version of the document. We did learn at yesterday's consultation that the preliminary letter of consent has been issued. We recommend that the council direct DGS to make this letter in the MOA public and to further ask them to use the MOA process to explore programmatic opportunities for all agencies and the university involved. Finally, the public deserves transparency and engagement throughout the rest of this project. Even for the archives advisory group, getting basic information has been difficult. The design contract was issued with minimal public input. The program requirements and schematic design documents were only released after weeks of pressure. This is not a good way to design a public building. Yesterday's design consultation demonstrated that public has expertise, both professional and lived, and can contribute to the project. The spectacular outcome of the Martin Luther King Memorial Library renovation testifies to that, and we should be looking for the same kind of engagement. We recommend that the Council direct DGS to post updates as soon as they are complete, continue design consultations, and communicate directly with the Archives Advisory Group. For the first time since Home Rule, the District of Columbia is on the path to preserving its heritage in a way that stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with its peers among the states. It is an investment and a substantial one that must be implemented carefully. The Archives Advisory Group recommends that it return the most of that investment by re requiring a vision of sustainability, exploring all programmatic opportunities, and committing to a dialogue and transparency with the public during the design process and beyond. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Neil, and thank, thank you for the work that you all have been doing. Um, I'll have some questions at the end of this panel. Um, next up, we have Bill Rice. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Good morning, council members. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, great. Good day. I am Bill Rice, testifying for myself about the DC archives. I am a longtime advocate for the preservation, dissemination, and examination of our history including as a founding member of the Friends of the DC Archives. My advocacy goes way back to the early Barry administration when Phil Ogilvie set up the present DC Archives at 1300 Naylor Court Northwest. We are about to celebrate two anniversaries. 50 years ago on Christmas Eve, 1973, President Nixon signed the Home Rule Act. And on July 4th, 2026, we will celebrate our 250th semi-quincentennial Independence Day. Unfortunately, the Naylor Court facility and DC records management are not as ready as they should be for these events. However, the council and the mayor are acting to correct these failings. The new archives building, as you've heard, is to be built at UDC. Dr. Lopez Matthews has been appointed as the state archivist and is giving very good leadership to that office. And the council established the Archives Advisory Group, which you've just heard from, and Mayor Bowser is asking for an additional $30 million to account for inflation to build the new archives at UDC, which I strongly support. The Department of General Services is the key implementing agency for the new archives. This involves coordination with UDC, including how the archives will fit in with the UDC archives and the Jazz archives at the at the campus already, with the office of the chief technology officer for this very high tech building, unlike as far as I know, anything that DGS has uh, undertaken before, with the district secretary and state archivist and with the community. DGS must listen to and respond to the constructive comments 
from Neil Flanagan, which you've just heard from, speaking for AAG, and Carl Bergman for the Friends of the DC Archives, and others who are anxious and who have the expertise that uh, should be contributed and should be welcomed by DGS. Yesterday's public discussion with Hartman Cox, the design consultants, was a good start. And also yesterday, if I may add, uh, Chairman Anita Bonds of the Committee on Executive Administration and Labor announced that she will be holding a roundtable on the archives sometime in May at UDC. And we will certainly be participating in that. In closing, without taking anything away from the previous DGS leadership, I welcome director and new director Delano Hunter and ask that he take a direct interest in this project and its connections to our home rule and independence anniversaries. And I would just, if I may, add that uh, DGS has a key role in preserving the existing records. A lot of them are still paper when they move agencies around. And if they could make sure that maybe as part of their contracts for moving, that special attention be made, that these records, which are so often just thrown away, are uh, given to or at least made contact with the state archivist so that he can determine if they should be saved and put into the archives. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. All right, this is a great panel. I'm gonna ask some good questions here because I know you all have the answer. I have high expectations for this panel given your years of experience, expertise and history in the district. Um, so thank you, Charles uh, Berger and Monty Edwards. Um, I'm gonna follow up with Director Hunter about why the Eastern market capital budget has been cut and how they're planning to maintain the facility. I just have a question for both of you. Can you explain what capital improvements you'd prioritize if Eastern Market is, is allocated only the fiscal year 24 proposed budget amount of 660,667? And what would be the impact of needing to forego the other improvements on Eastern Market's operation? Yes. Oh, Mr. Edwards, you are muted. You could just unmute for me. Excuse me. The most critical thing are the controllers. These are the controls that monitor the valves, the pumps, the fans in the air conditioning and heating system and turn on the valves, open the valves, turn on the pumps, and turn on the fans and the air handlers to provide the conditioned air throughout the market. Now, because of what was uh, provided in the Eastern Market budget over the last two years for the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, which by the way, is a complete replacement of the air conditioning system and all new condensing units on the roof, allowed enough to accomplish the replacement of the basic system and all of the controllers that had failed. But in the process, they identified some $800,000 worth of controllers that were not functioning properly and would probably fail within the next few years. Those are the most critical items because if any of them fail, we lose the benefit of this new HVAC system and at least a part or perhaps all of the market is without HVAC. That is the most critical. It's $800,000 in 2022 dollars escalated. It is a higher number, but those need to be done we need to have the funds available to replace them before they fail. Okay. Yes, if, if I may, I would only comment, the market is in the food business and uh, the lack of total reliability we've had with the air conditioning has cost not only our vendors, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years, but also the city uh, okay. because we've had to uh, catch up with the system because it was never that reliable. So we actually see this step as uh, one solving the first problem and solving uh, that we don't have to come back uh, to the city for additional funds. So I would just like to augment 
Levante had added. Okay. And um, you've already, I'm, I'm expecting you've already had a conversation with Councilmember Allen, um, uh, Charles Allen as well from Ward 6 and his staff. Yes, we have. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've worked diligently at these uh, numbers because we understand the position the city is in and the requests that we're making is just goes directly to the viability of the uh, gotcha. market's uh, reliability of the market's performance. So, got you. I understand. I appreciate that. Um, and I'll have some questions for DGS, but you all really painted a very clear picture here as to, to why this is necessary. Um, and so, uh, I, I look to working in this budget with uh, DGS and also with Councilmember Allen to, to see what to try to make this happen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And if, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I want to go, uh, Neil, I want to come to you um, as well as Bill. When you last testified before the committee, you shared concerns related to community engagement. Um, it sounds like there was a, a meeting of such yesterday. Um, sim similarly, um, has that improved since we last spoke? And in, in that also, explain to me like what you want this community engagement to look like. If you're talking to Director Hunter, uh, what do you say, this is what productive um, community engagement and listening will look like uh, moving forward under your leadership? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I would say that uh, yesterday's yesterday's meeting was pretty close to to what I think is is a good a good meeting. Um, okay. They uh, they uh, there was a, a, a basically a presentation then a Q and A. I think it's a great step for an orientation. I think um, you know another thing is you know trying to under is is both presenting the work and then also trying to understand what people need. Um, there were a lot of uh, there, there was no particular engagement with potential users of the archives, which I think is something they could improve on. And then the, the documents were not posted before or even after. Um, you know, I don't think those are the worst things for the first kind of the first kind of presentation. Um, but those would be uh, very useful further steps is to target specific groups and to to work with a very an agenda to not not to not to let the public design it, because there always are considerations the public can't see, but to understand what their needs are and what their uh, concerns are um, and the, the sort of more broad vision. And that, that happens, I think, best through a, a dialogic process. And I am an architect. So right. uh, you know, getting in and, and really, you you oftentimes hear, you come up with ideas that are not, the, the, the you say something, uh, the architect says something, a third thing may be the result of that conversation, right? That's right. kind of what we're doing. And um, because it is a process of discovery. That's right. And that, that's what we're looking for. So I would say that DGS had, this was an improvement. This was led by the, this was led by the archives uh, by, by Dr. Lopez Matthews. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, DGS has not posted, still has not posted the drawings we saw yesterday. So, um, you know, that, that is, that is, uh, uh, good and I, I think uh, it's the first step but let's let's show that this can be I, I see this is a, it was proof we could do it well it's not going to be a disaster so let's keep doing more does that answer your question yes that does mr rice i wanted to give you opportunity as well you're muted i would very much second what uh, neil said i i think the uh, round table that uh Council Member Bonds will be holding as a great opportunity to move more in that uh, direction. And uh, I draw your attention to what I hope will be Carl Bergman's oral testimony. I read his written testimony, and he particularly focuses on the techni technological requirements as he sees them, which uh, based on the design that he has seen, and he can explain this, of course, much better than I, all the digital stuff seems to be something of an afterthought and the facilities devoted to it do not seem adequate. But again, I think we're moving in the right direction as Neil just said. And if I may also add my support for what is being asked for Eastern Market, I regularly shop there and please, please take care of it. Thank okay. you. You got it, Mr. Rice. Um, thank you so much for that. 
Um, I will, this is what I'll do, uh, you know, I'm going to follow up with Director Hunter later today with your questions about the design sustainability standards um, and to ask that they share the, the MOA with the uh, advisory group. And my hope is that moving forward, they can just upload, I mean, create like a website doc page and just upload the documents after every meeting. I think that would be really useful and helpful. Um, and we've seen that done in, in prior projects. So my hope is they will do that. Um, before I move to the next panel, Councilmember Parker, did you have any questions for this esteemed panel? Yes. First, I want to come to Chuck and Monty. I'm, I'm looking at some of the budget requests. Can you just quickly detail the communication that DGS had with you when they came up with the $2.4 million budget request? And you're muted, Monty. Monty, if you could read. Yes, DGS generally comes to us in the fall in the form of the market manager that presents their proposed budget for the coming six year budget period. We comment on that in written comments, which under the legislation are canceled along with our, um, uh, along with the DGS proposal. They did not reflect our comments in their budget proposal to council and I'm afraid they may not have communicated uh, the D, the uh, MCAC comments on that proposed budget. So I think there was some lack of communication there in terms of how East how MCAC viewed the budget in consultation with what we know on a day to day basis compared to what DGS was proposing in the budget. But uh, generally, in the past, we've had pretty good uh, communications with DGS in terms of when we comment on their proposed budget uh, and what they finally end up coming to the mayor's office with. We, we have no knowledge what happens between the mayor and DGS. I'm sure there's some, uh, some uh, discussions there. And what the mayor then sends to council may or may not reflect what DGS has proposed to MCAT back in November. Understood. Does that help you? I, I hear you loud and clear that the priority request is for the HVAC controllers for the market. Um, there are a number of other requests that you have and I would just love clarity around how you all are coming up with these figures. And so I'm seeing here um, work on electrical outlets for about $200,000. You say uh, replacement of brick and regrouting for about $90,000, so on and so forth. How did you come up with the dollar amounts in your testimony? All of these we came up with in consultation with the market manager who obtained estimates from contractors. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the regrouting of the brick was a part of the replacement of the stone that the council approved last year and is now underway, but that could not be fitted in to the allowed budget dollars. Got it. Okay, All that these is helpful. Are contractor figures are not uh, MCAT figures. That, that is helpful. That is what I was trying to get clear on. Uh, thank you for that. And I would uh, also, Neil and Bill, uh, thank you for your continued work and advocacy for uh, the archives. Can you uh, just speak to what you may, what do you think prompted the change in yesterday's meeting? I'm hearing that it was productive and perhaps a shift. Do you have an opinion of what may have prompted that? Neil? Yeah, um, I, I think I think you know we 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 put pressure on. Uh, I think there's the reason that it happened is that there was apparently was some there was some confusion with. Uh, I I would credit I would credit the archivist. Let's put it that way. It's been a goal of of his. I think there was some pressure from um, from uh, individuals higher above him at the at the in the executive suite um, that I think were reticent to have this public meeting. We asked nicely. We proved the case, and and I think I think this again is demonstration that 
again, it was not run by DGS and I would like to see a little bit more DGS involvement, but uh, that's, that I would say is the main reason is there was, uh, you know, there was, a, it was the initiative that archivist and they were able to get through the political concerns about it. If, if I might, I, I think just uh, it's, it's beginning to uh, be realized at the highest levels of the administration and, and the council, how important the archives really is. Uh, not only for the two anniversaries that I mentioned, but uh, if you wanna be a state, if we wanna be a state, you have to have a real archive. If you, if you go to states across the country, they have whole establishments much bigger than ours for their records, for their history, for, for, the, for, 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 for preserving and disseminating the, the history of, of who they are. And in that connection, if I may add again about Eastern Market, uh, the, the banner that's at the main entrance on 7th Street is kind of faded. I hope you're planning to place that. Thank you. If, Thank you. If, if I may, I'd, I'd point out uh, that- I would just yes. say in 10 seconds because I'm way over time. Sorry. No, go for it in 10, in 10 seconds if you can. And uh, oh, Chairwoman Lewis George is gonna- it's it's yeah. being it's it's being replaced, and as I mentioned, the market is an old historic house. With uh, we have a lot of uh, always have to be making repairs. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. But the fruit is always <laughs> fresh. <laughs> <laughs> the fruit the food is always fresh. Um, thank you so much to to this panel, um, and I'll have some follow up questions for for DGS. I do realize the importance. Uh, of our, our Eastern Market um, community, as well as our archives, which you uh, put really well, um, Mr. Rice. So, um, and I agree with you, we're gonna have statehood. We gotta have an archives uh, that, that is up to par with all the design sustainability factors in it as well. Um, next up, uh, our next panel includes uh, Marcy Bern Bernbaum, DC Public Restrooms, Kate Coventry, a Deputy Director of Legislative Strategy for DC Fiscal Policy Institute, uh, Leonard Greenberger, uh, DC Public Restrooms, uh, Gordon Chafin, and Scott Williamson, Sierra Club DC. Good morning, committee. Good morning. Good morning, Marsha. Um, a little over a week ago, while I was on a one month vacation in Germany, stroll in Czechoslovakia, strolling the streets of Prague, I received a phone call from Council Member Nadeau's office informing me that the mayor had decided to put in an indefinite hold on the public restroom, standalone public restroom pilot, and remove funds from the budget. And uh, to put it mildly, I was stunned. <laughs> it's like, what? Um, and what, well, the reason I was stunned was the, the law has received its first funding in the FY2020 budget and has been in the budget ever since. So I have a hard time, given the clearly documented need and the commitment of government to keep money in, why the mayor has chosen to remove the funding. Um, as I believe you are aware, we, uh, in our capacity as a downtown DC public respite, the uh, Fredman Initiative of uh, People for Fairness and now as public restrooms, have from the beginning taken a research-based approach. Our objective was to share information elsewhere and learn. And in this process, we identified uh, both the need for clean, safe public restrooms and several models that were clean, safe, and affordable. And the research, which both inspired and formed Law 22280, makes it very clear that unlike other cities in Europe and the States and Asia, and even increasingly in our own country, who like Washington, D.C., have gone backward in the past or were returning, they recognize the importance of public restrooms and are making them increasingly available. While we have a dearth, <laughs> at last count in the downtown area near uh, off the mall, uh, five restrooms open during the day for limited hours and two at a distance is open 24 in Lincoln and Jefferson Memorials at night off the beaten track. 
so also we carried out a study yearly between 2015 and 17, which we visited businesses in five areas to identify whether we could go into them, whether they were clean and safe. And indeed, as is documented in the footnote, found an increasing decline. And if you go out today to most areas of downtown, you'll see, you'll see signs saying for customers only. But from a human perspective, there's no doubt that ready access to clean, safe public restrooms is absolutely critical. I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep getting off of here. Um, UN in July 2010 issued a resolution that declares that safe and clear drinking water and sanitation is a human right essential to the full enjoyment of life and all other human rights. Access is critical to personal health. Articles available from important journals show that lack of access when nature calls can have adverse medical uh, repercussions. We women tend to keep urine in our bladder for long periods of time. We risk getting UTIs and in some cases, uh, kidney infections and medical evidence shows that health problems because the result of an individual's delay defecation. They also demonstrate that many people like myself, I'm older, my bladder is smaller, our restroom challenge. Many of us face major challenges. I'm not one of them yet, given that when the urge comes, we need to find a restroom immediately and many will not even leave their houses to walk, to shop, to exercise. And we know it's documented also the human fecal face poses a health hazard as it may contain a, a range of disease causing organisms that include viruses, bacteria, AIDS, and others. But apart from that, it also makes good business sense to have them knowing that there are public restrooms nearby are 20 million tourists who, who descend upon us yearly are more apt to leave the mall and go shopping in different areas, thus contributing to our economy. People who are restroom challenge are knowing they are restrooms will go down and shop. Um, having restrooms nearby, businesses are less apt to have people come in and use them. And of course, there's less poop to scoop. I find it interesting that since we started this and since the law went into effect in the last couple of years, several prominent cities in our country have gone ahead in short order and installed clean, safe standalone. So I list them in my testimony. A few of the highlights include San Francisco, Miami, Charleston, Hyattsville. And even in the last couple of weeks, I've seen references to three cities that just now are deciding to install restrooms, Somerville, Bellingham, Washington, and Philadelphia. I also find it interesting that in a recent amendment to the DC comprehensive plan, uh, directs the DC government to take action to see that more are available. And also the mayor in, in, in her comeback plan, her three, uh, it, it, it's implicit to the achievement of her vision. So for the reasons listed above, we urge you and your fellow DC council members to take action to reinstate the capital operating funds in 24. Our nation's capital cannot afford to take a step backwards while other cities are recognizing the need. Thank you. And I would be happy to answer any questions. And I apologize for some typos. I was preparing this on the airplane when I was coming home yesterday. Thank you. Uh, no problem at all. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'll have some questions um, uh, towards the end. Uh, Kate Coventry, good morning, Kate. Good morning, Chairperson Lewis George and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kate Coventry. I'm the Deputy Director of Legislative Strategy at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. DCFPI is a nonprofit organization that shapes racially just tax, budget, and policy decisions by centering black and brown communities in our research and analysis, community partnership, partnerships and advocacy efforts to advance an anti-racist, anti-racist, equitable future. DCFPI is here today to ask the council to restore the funding to build to build standalone public restrooms that the mayor removed in her proposed FY 2024 budget. Public restrooms promote racial and economic equity as a local study found that businesses were more likely to deny access to a, rest, uh, access to a restroom to black non-customers who appeared possibly homeless than white customers who appeared housed. Most residents experiencing homelessness do not have the money to make purchases at establishments so that they can gain access to restrooms. The mayor's proposed change change is a callous one among many others in her budget for housing and homelessness programs. Public restrooms are fundamental to human dignity and health. 
Passed unanimously by the Council in late 2018, the Public Restroom Facilities Installation and Promotion Act calls for the creation of pilot standalone restrooms in the district in locations recommended by a working group appointed for this purpose. The working group released a draft report with proposed locations in May 2022. The legislation required the mayor to install two public restrooms within 180 days of the release of the report. Rather than installing these restrooms, the mayor removed funding for them from the proposed FY 2024 budget and includes language in the Budget Support Act, making the standalone restroom provision subject to a new appropriation of funding. Public restrooms are especially critical for people who are restroom challenged. When seniors, pregnant women, young people, young children, and people on certain medications have to go, they have to go urgently. Knowing that there are public restrooms readily accessible, people are more apt to visit parks, ride their bikes, jog, and walk. Easily accessible, clean, safe restrooms make good business sense and help foster tourism. As a result, more and more cities are investing in public restrooms. Residents experiencing homelessness in particular stand to benefit from restroom expansions. The pandemic made restroom access worse as many downtown businesses closed restrooms that non-customers were once able to use. And even prior to the pandemic, there was evidence that fewer businesses were allowing non-customers to use the restrooms. The People for Fairness Coalition visited 85 businesses in five areas of D.C. that have high levels of pedestrian traffic and people experiencing homelessness to see if they would allow the general public to access their restrooms. In 2015, they found just over half the businesses allowed anyone to use the restroom. One year later, they visited these businesses again and found that 10 of these businesses had started limiting access to individuals who weren't customers. They also found that businesses discriminated against a People for Fairness Coalition member experiencing homelessness who visited the restroom. They allowed a white woman who appeared housed to use the restroom, but not a black man who appeared possibly homeless. Most residents experiencing homelessness do not have money to make purchases to gain access to restrooms. This is not merely an inconvenience. It can have devastating health and public health consequences. People are encouraged to wash their hands frequently to stop the spread of COVID. Catherine Crossland of Unity Healthcare has testified about her patients skipping life-saving blood pressure, heart, and HIV and AIDS medication because they can lead to an urgent need for the restroom. Southern California experienced a large hepatitis A outbreak from 2017 to 2019 because of the lack of toilets and hand-washing facilities for people experiencing homelessness. At least 21 people died as a result. By increasing access to public restrooms, the district can be a friendlier place for residents with illnesses and disabilities, tourists, children and their caretakers, and residents experiencing homelessness. I urge the council to restore funding for th this purpose. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, next up, we will have Leonard uh, Greenberger. Uh, good morning, Leonard. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I like my colleagues, Marcy and Kate. Uh, I've been working with DC Public Restrooms for more than eight years now to bring better access to safe, clean public restrooms for residents, workers, and tourists in our wonderful city. It's been a long and at times frustrating process, uh, but ultimately I've always found it to be very fulfilling and rewarding because despite the many obstacles that we've had to overcome, I've always felt as though we were making real progress towards that important goal. It is therefore with great regret that I must report to you that for the first time, I feel as though we are about to take a giant step backwards. The prospect of putting funding on hold for the standalone re public restroom pilot and of having no funds in next year's budget for that pilot seems almost impossible to believe, but here we are. So with my time today, I'd like to take us back to first principles. Uh, in the 30 plus years that I've lived in Washington, DC and its environs, I've watched the city grow from what was a pretty sleepy Southern town into a world-class metropolis with incredible museums, restaurants, attractions, and a robust economic engine powered by far more than federal government spending, like it was when I first arrived in the city. And yet when it comes to providing access to safe, clean public restrooms, we simply don't match up to other world-class cities around the globe. And that matters to a lot of people. It matters to the businesses that suffer because people are reluctant to visit the city's downtown core, as Marcy described, because they worry about finding a restroom when the need arises, or because they have a lot of poop to scoop around their stores or businesses on a Monday morning. 
It matters to the millions of tourists who visit the city. We have talked to tour guides who avoid certain areas of town because they just can't be sure that they'll be able to find a restroom uh, for their guests should the need arise. And we know that international visitors are often shocked when they learn that public restrooms are not widely and readily available as they are in the cities that they call home. It matters to the bus drivers and gig workers who depend on public restrooms. And it matters to bikers and walkers and runners like me who often have to map their routes carefully to make sure that they are never too far from a public restroom. In fact, just a few weeks ago, my fiance and I took our my three stepkids down to the mall and we were enjoying a beautiful day. Suddenly one of us had an urgent need for a restroom. Fortunately, we were very close to the Hirshhorn Museum, but had the need struck even 20 minutes later, the Hirshhorn and all the other Smithsonian museums on the mall would have been closed. And I honestly don't know what we would have done other than maybe broken the law. It was a not so subtle reminder of why the work we've been doing together over the past eight years is so important. But that work remains unfinished. So on behalf of myself and the many, many residents, business owners, and runners like me, I strongly urge the committee to restore funding for the standalone public restroom pilot. Together, we've made incredible strides on this vital issue, and I would really like to keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next up, let me see. Just check in and see if I see Laura or Gordon. All right, I don't see Laura or, or Gordon. Um, so we will just uh, get to the questions. Um, thank you for speaking, all of you for speaking with us today. I'm following up with Director Hunter about this later today. Um, as you know, on our first opportunity for questions, uh, the Friday after the budget was dropped, um, I did pose this question uh, and, and sort of uh, my frustration uh, with the uh, administration um, at that time uh, and, and did not really get a clear answer uh, other than this was a tough budget year uh, of, as to why we were moving backwards in this manner, specifically around DC public restrooms. Um, Marcy shared clear health risk of limited restroom access and Kate and Leonard they both made clear that uh, the, this disinvestment harms our unhoused residents most, um, but also those who have families who like to run, who, who want to enjoy this city uh, uh, and not break the law, which, you know, you can't find a bathroom and need to relieve yourself, you could potentially uh, be, be subject to, to breaking the law. Um, and so uh, I, um, I, I will be working uh, as chair of this committee um, with my other colleagues, especially Councilmember Nadeau, uh, to, to do what we can. Um, have you all, I wanna ask you, when, when I asked the mayor and her budget director about this earlier this month, they said the cost estimates for each facility had gone way up from what was originally planned. Um, does that match uh, what you've heard as well? Um, and how much would you like to see allocated for the public restroom pilot in the fiscal year 24 budget? That's a, a very appropriate question. I would like to send you a spreadsheet that we prepared last August looking at different standalone restroom models, including a newer one that's come that's a throw. Yes, indeed. When the budget was originally established, it was based on a testimony I made in 2018 with the Portland Loo, which was one of the, and it's doing very well, one of the more economical ones. <clears throat> Since then with COVID, uh, the price has gone up and uh, the estimates were based on the standalone being class five. So yes, that, that price has gone up. However, uh, time moves on and uh, just to, right now, a company called the Throne Lab has designed and has put in place standalone restrooms that meet all of the criteria that are clean and safe, that you're non-touch, that are actually do not have to be installed. The, the expense is installing it and on a water and sewer line, especially if it's not nearby, I urge you to go and visit it in the, I guess it's the Southwest or waterfront. Yeah can, you send, yeah, can you send me that address? Yeah, yeah, and I'll send you the information. And we, we looked at costs over a five-year period. This one example, I'm not saying it's the only one, shows that it's very economical over a period of time. So uh, 
Yeah. Uh, now, what we don't know, because DGS has chosen not to inform us of what's happening, is that the working group report infers that it might be appropriate to, to design stand restrooms that are appropriate for each site. And that can be very expensive, especially if you're building bricks and mortar. So since we don't know where they're headed, that would be expensive. But yeah, we do have options that make sense. Other cities are doing them. New investments are coming all the time, like the throne, which is very economical. So I'll send you that information. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm being told Sierra Club is now here. Before I ask Councilman Parker for questions, if he has questions, I want to give him an opportunity to testify on this panel. Scott Williamson, I see you. If you could unmute. Hi, ah, yes. How are you? Hey. So, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my testimony is not on the public restrooms, but rather on the DTS budget for retrofits. If you were asking for further conversation on the restrooms, I wanted to defer to any questions there first before I vote. Okay. Um, Councilmember Parker, do you have any questions for this panel? Right. I don't I don't see Councilmember Parker. He doesn't have any questions, panel. Okay, so what I'll do is say thank you to this panel um, for your testimony and please make sure you follow up with the information um, and appreciate uh, each everybody's uh, perspective there. Um, and what we'll do, Scott, is put you at the beginning of the next panel um, and then I'll call them up and then you can begin your testimony uh, right after we have called everyone up for this next panel, which includes Karen Kasker, Roosevelt Stay, Opportunity Academy, Dylan Craig, Roosevelt Stay, Opportunity Academy, Danielle, uh, Performing Arts Teacher, Jackson Reed High School, Morgan Fulford, uh, Student, Jackson Reed High School, and Elijah Gold Moritz, uh, Student, Jackson Reed High School. Mr. Williamson, you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Councilmember. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Sierra Club DC chapter. Um, we appreciate also last year uh, your support of and passage of the Greener Government Buildings Act, which mandates that the buildings owned or financed in significant part by the government must adhere to net zero energy standards in the next few years. So. That act is wonderful, but it will only take effect if it's funded. And if the DC Council fails to fund the law sufficiently, then the passage of the act is, is greatly weak in terms of its importance. Uh, right now, the mayor's budget does not sufficiently support the transition that's called for under that law. Uh, the fiscal impact statement for that law expected about $8.4 million in costs in the first fiscal year, nine or about $10 million over its four-year financial plan. However, right now we're seeing a DGS capital budget of only 1.5 million for retrofitting district buildings uh, in 2024. 1.5 million is being spread across. This DGS is managing 300 large buildings. By large, I mean over 10,000 square feet. Uh, about half of those will need improvements even to comply with the building energy performance standards for compliance site, let alone a net zero standard. So, when you consider that even the most minor retrofits that DGS has considered, which are uh, operational changes and uh, improvements to windows and insulation, can cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars per building, 1.5 million simply won't get very far across the portfolio in terms of the, uh, the retrofitting that's necessary that's called for in the greener government law. We also think that the Missed opportunities for future budget relief are dramatic. Net zero buildings have proven to save their operators. Discovery Elementary School, which is just across the river in Arlington, is saving around $118,000 per year on utility costs versus other buildings by virtue of having been built to a net zero standard in about 2015. We also think that recreation centers schools and other government agencies built to these standards who are going to enable children and adults to learn, play, and work in more comfortable and critically more healthy indoor environments. 
Net zero buildings crucially eliminate all combustion of fossil fuels in the building, which means that they're removing toxic indoor air pollution that contributes to asthma and, is, and a range of severe health impacts. From our reading of the DGS Energy Management Plan, which is DGS's own estimation of how much this all should cost and how much work really needs to be done, uh, we think DGS should be funded at a, at a number about 10 times as large for this element. We understand that moving 1.5 million to 25 million is a major lift, and we see that that might not be possible for the committee to add that amount in one year. However, whatever additional funding you can add to this line, you pay huge dividends for the district in very short order. And I, and I elevate that point to simply say that many of the retrofits are things done in three months to a year and can make significant dents right out of the gate. So this really is a sort of a fast turnaround impact in terms of utility savings uh, that would come into the next couple of years worth of budget. I'll take my last moment or so to say that more broadly, Sierra Club is deeply concerned that the mayor's proposed budget fails to fund several essential programs that are vital for both the district to achieve its climate change goals, specifically net zero emissions citywide by 2050, and to improve the quality of living and working in the city. We're disappointed to see that the proposed budget would defund so many crucial programs, zero waste initiatives like ditch the disposables program, the clean water initiatives relating to lead line replacement, clean energy initiatives like the building energy performance standard, which would be pushed back three years by this budget. We strongly oppose, oppose the mayor's proposal to delay the BEPS compliance cycle by three years. We are only 27 years from 2050 and delays at this point simply make no more sense. So we'll, I'll submit full commentary uh, online through written format, but I'll stop at this point and thank you very much both council members for the opportunity to testify today. Happy to answer any questions and Sierra Club definitely does. I wanna finish on a high point. We appreciate your environmental support and leadership uh, over the last couple of years and we look forward to working with you going forward. Uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the Sierra Club DC and, and all your all your vital work uh, across all the agencies here in the District of Columbia because all of everybody plays a, a, a part. And I'll have some questions uh, at the end of this panel. Uh, Karen Kaskert, uh, uh, Roosevelt State Opportunity Academy. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Councilwoman Lois George and everyone else. Um, my name is Karen Kassekert. I am a Ward One resident, a DCPS staff member, the LSAT chairperson for, and the LSAT chairperson for Roosevelt's Day. We want to start by um, appreciating everything specifically you did to get us the new to us building at Garnet Patterson. Uh, we very much appreciate being here. Our our school is is absolutely in a better place because of it. Uh, we recognize that the city council is facing quite a few budget requests, so we've narrowed down two requests and then kind of a favor. Um, one kind of tagging on to the to the gentleman who went before me. We need a new HVAC system in Garnet Patterson. Um, currently, we have windows open while the boiler is running, while the AC units are running, in order to make the temperature um, conducive for our students, and that is just not okay. Um, from a student safety perspective, from a community wellness perspective, or appropriate environmental stewardship. So um, if we can get that funded sooner than later. Additionally, um, we do plan on getting our science labs up and running on the third floor. And right now we don't have appropriate ventilation. So that would become a safety issue as soon as we start occupying those in August. Secondly, we're not quite sure how this happened, but there is not a funded plan for an elevator to go from the ground floor into our basement. The basement is where our cafeteria is going to be, where our CTE programs are going to be. And we do have quite a few um, older or disabled student, staff, and community members who need to be able to utilize that space. So our understanding from DGS is that there is somewhat of a plan to put an elevator in there, but they have no funding for it. Uh, we find this to be a problem for many, many reasons that I probably don't need to outline for you. Um, 
So I'll, I'll keep going because I know you have a long day. Um, our last favor is that um, we would really like DGS to provide us with an updated scope of work. In our last SIT meeting, we were told that um, we cannot have one and that we, um, and when our community member asked, are we just supposed to trust DGS, the answer was yes. So if we could have kind of a written idea of what's in the scope and what's not in the scope and what's being covered, that would be really great. Um, our state is an extraordinary school that serves students who have been systematically marginalized from education for a variety of reasons. Our students have given us the honor of correcting prior wrongs and assisting them to a brighter future. So please help by help us serve them by giving them a healthy, safe, and accessible facility. I am happy to answer any of your questions. And as always, we very much appreciate your support, Councilwoman Lewis George. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. And I'll, I'll have some questions uh, at the end of the panel. Okay. Um, next up, I see Dylan Craig, Roosevelt State Opportunity Academy. Good morning. Um, I am here to talk about uh, the similar issues that Karen just brought up, but um, I'm Dylan Craig, a teacher and union representative at Roosevelt State Opportunity Academy and award for resident. Um, and like Karen, I'm here to discuss some urgent needs that are currently not funded in the scope of construction for our move to the Garnett Patterson building. Um, first, I'd like to thank the council and DGS for the work thus far with Roosevelt Stay, as I know the move to the Garnett Patterson building was short notice and a large undertaking. Our community is very thankful to have our own space and it has benefited the school culture and student success greatly already. Um, but still in many ways, our community is still being shortchanged. Um, the budget to move us into the Garnett Patterson uh, building was enough simply to renovate a swing space for a smaller school. Enough money was not budgeted to make the appropriate changes for an entire school community to stay permanently. We are already cutting corners to stay within the construction budget, minimizing how many walls need to be removed, limiting the new furniture and keeping the worn floors in many rooms. Um, however, again, we're still very happy to be here, but there are two items that cannot be ignored to make our building suitable for students and staff. Um, first, uh, like Karen said, we do not have a modern HVAC system in the building. Currently, we're working with the boiler and window air units in each room. The temperature is so difficult to control that most staff members have their window units running along with the boiler and often the window cracked as well. The temperatures also vary throughout the day and from room to room and the Garnett Patterson building is very large. Window units in the boiler may have been acceptable options when it was only a temporary swing space, but now with the building in full use, this is widely unsustainable and a wasteful way to heat and cool the areas. As I'm sure you know, both window units and boilers use energy significantly less efficiently than the modern HVAC systems, and we are using both, again, at the same time. Um, compounded with the size of the building, we are wasting an incredible amount of energy and making a very uncomfortable environment for our students and staff. These learning conditions are going to have an impact on our school's success, sadly. Second, there are currently no funds for an elevator to the basement level of the building where our cafeteria and CTE programs will be housed. This is unacceptable and seems like a lawsuit waiting to happen. Having the cafeteria and a substantial amount of our programming not accessible students and staff with disabilities is unheard of and completely irresponsible. Also, our cafeteria and custodial staff will not have an elevator to take supplies, food, and garbage to and from areas, forcing them to take large and cumbersome halls up and down the stairs. This is both inefficient and unsafe. Again, the lack of accessibility is unfair and negligent, and it is almost unbelievable that we have to testify and ask for funding for an elevator before a student is unable to ac access their classroom and a place to eat with friends. Overall, budgeting an HVAC system in a capital, as a capital project would be aligned with the city's and DGS's sustainability and environmental goals. Budgeting an elevator to our lower level for the cafeteria and CTE programs will create accessibility to our entire building for everyone. Both asks are reasonable and are investments that will pay off immediately and in the future. Um, and again, I thank you for your time and all that uh, the council and DGS has done thus far. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your your testimony. And I will I will have some questions at the end of this panel. Um, I want to check. I know I see Elijah Gold Moritz here, Jackson Reed, student Jackson Reed High School. Elijah, if you're here, you can unmute. Good morning, Elijah. Good morning. Well, 
Okay. You can go and turn the if you can turn your volume up. Okay. That better? A little bit. You're just gonna talk loud. Yeah, I'll just talk loud. Right. Okay. Good, good afternoon, Chair Lewis, George, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Elijah Gomorich, and I'm a Ward 4 resident. I'm a sophomore at Jackson High School. I joined the drama program in my freshman year. Elijah, can you? is there any way you can turn your volume up anymore? Uh, sorry. It's I mean, pain. And I want everybody to hear you. Right. Uh, maybe there's a mic. Yeah, just get as close to the mic as you can. Yeah, yeah. Audio. Okay. Uh, I think I'll just try to hold the mic up in my mouth. Okay, just speak as loud as you can. I just want them to hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm struggling to find the mic, but I'll just talk. I'll just talk as as I can. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Lewis and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Elijah Gomorets, and I'm an award for resident. I'm a sophomore at Jackson High School. I joined the drama program in my freshman year after doing theater in middle school. I'm here today to bring attention to the state of disrepair at, at the Jackson Reed Auditorium has been under. The shortcomings of our theater equipment have made it impossible to put on productions in our auditorium. We are asking the committee to allocate $550,000 from the FY2024 Department of General Services budget to support the assessment and repairs of the Jackson Reed Auditorium to ensure it is fully functional as originally designed. I joined the theater program in my freshman year because acting is a passion of mine and a great way that I have found for me to express myself artistically. I was nervous when I first joined the program, but I was met with nothing but kindness and acceptance as soon as I walked in the door. My first production at Jackson Reed was put on in the auditorium, and the issues with the space as well as the theater equipment were apparent. These issues caused actors and especially the technical staff to put in an enormous amount of effort to put on the production as intended, in spite of the problems. One issue was with the sound system in the auditorium. There were not enough mics for everyone speaking parts in the cast, so we had to share, scrambling between scenes to give mics to people that needed them. Even then, many of the mics did not even work. Several actors, including myself, were forced to simply predict and hope we were heard over the band. There were also some set pieces from another year's production hanging from the ceiling on stage, which were an issue to remove due to the lip machine not working. Instead, the technical staff had to come up with a solution to temporarily hide these set pieces so that they did not interfere with the show. Bearing witness to these instances, had me thinking that it was definitely time for new equipment, and that it was irresponsible for the play staff to have not replaced the equipment yet. I later found out that in 2011, when Jackson Reed had its renovation, the Department of General Services purposely purchased used and discontinued equipment to save money on building the auditorium. This is the equipment still being used in the Jackson Reed Auditorium today. We can't find parts to repair the faulty equipment as the equipment has been discontinued. This faulty equipment includes light, sound equipment, and stage projectors. This lack of functioning equipment has forced the drama program to begin exclusively putting productions on in the Black Box Theater, which has less than a fourth of the seating capacity of the auditorium, with maybe half of the stage space. We have three recommendations. First, we are asking that the committee allocate $550,000 in the FY2024 Department of General Services budget to support the assessment and repairs of the Jackson Reed Auditorium to ensure it is fully functional as desired. Specifically, repairs should include one, space and seating, electrical system, walls, floors, sound systems, lighting systems, lifts, audiovisual systems, and other equipment and furniture. Next, we ask that DGS be required to communicate with the with and issues quarterly reports to communicate with issues and reports to the Jackson Reed High Appointed Advisory Board. Finally, we ask that the committee require DGS to develop and share comprehensive maintenance 
and leasing claims to ensure that the auditorium remains in excellent condition for Jackson Reed and the community to use in the foreseeable future. Thank you so much for your time and attention to this issue. I hope that you take our request into great consideration. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, I'm, what I'm gonna do is ask questions of uh, the panel that we have now. Elijah, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna have you stay. Um, I know there's uh, some other Jackson Reed students uh, that wanna testify and I'm gonna have all of you testify on, a, on one large panel together. So Councilman Parker and I can ask you all questions as a collective. Um, so if I have any Jackson Reed students here, what I want you all to do is raise your hand now um, and my team is gonna begin to promote you. Um, and then in, in, in the meantime, as you all are getting situated, um, I have some questions uh, for the panel, excluding Elijah, because I'm gonna include him uh, in the questions for the next panel. So um, I'm gonna come back uh, to our, our first panel, uh, our, our panel. Um, Thank you, Mr. Williamson. And I have a number of questions for Director Hunter later about their sustainability investments. Um, we asked some questions during the initial questioning period uh, with the mayor and the city administrator. Um, it was unclear to me sort of what the, uh, sort of whether the FTEs are funded and are in place doing the work that we need for green government buildings or uh, that was something that was cut and we need to um, be able to ensure the FTEs there to stand that up is there. Um, so that's a clarifying question I have uh, moving forward for today. So I'm gonna ask some questions. Um, and I'll also ask him about Sierra's Club viewpoints that we're underfunding the energy management plan. Um, so we'll uh, thank you for testifying. I'll have some follow up there. Um, uh, to our Roosevelt Day Opportunity uh, leaders and teachers. Um, thank you for speaking today. It's always very helpful to hear from our teachers about their working conditions and our students' learning conditions. Um, I have a lot of questions for DCS tomorrow about their small capital project budgets, uh, which is what we hope to tap into to support as like the elevator and the improved HVAC system. Um, so what I wanna ask you, do you know where the cafeteria was before when this school was a junior high school? Um, it seems odd that they're doing this now when it's been a, been a school for so long. Um, and then can you share an update on the SIP process and general engagement that's been going on uh, with DCPS and DGS uh, for, for the further renovations? I think, I th thank you, Council Member. I think uh, Mr. Craig and I can probably tag team these answers. Um, first, I, I am not certain where the cafeteria was. I think it was on the second floor, perhaps, um, but I'm, I'm not certain about that. Um, in regards to the SIT process, we recently learned that our liaison with DGS um, was no longer with DGS. So um, we are uncertain about that, about that situation right now. Um, up to this point, I would say that it has been um, a little bit of a rocky situation. Um, we have done quite a bit of advocacy. Thank you to your office and to other offices who have helped us um, through finding out additional information about asbestos plans, et cetera. Um, it, it seems like, I haven't been through this process before, but it seems like we're doing um, more work on our part and kind of dragging them along sometimes. Um, it all, We have also learned that this is not an official sit because this is not an official modernization. This is not a renovation. This is simply a facelift. Um, Craig, I don't know if there's anything that I that I missed there that you'd like to add. No, I think you you outlined it. Um, I, I'm not sure where the cafeteria was either. They did talk about having, um, you know, the library, which is the upper level, kind of serve as a pseudo cafeteria for time we don't have an elevator, but that's gonna be our library. So we really don't want that to happen. Um, and also, again, that still doesn't answer the questions about how soon as we get down to the CTE programs down there. Sure. Um, but, uh, and as far as the, the SIT process, I think um, Karen outlined it pretty well. Um, so no, nothing to add there. I did just receive word that the kitchen has always been downstairs. I think that oh, okay. the, the ADA compliance may just not have been, um, 
I think it's it's different if it's a swing space and you don't have ADA compliance versus when this is going to be our permanent home. And there's, there's no funding for that. And yeah, and just to add, we have brought these concerns to during the SIP process throughout the entire thing. And usually the answer is that there's no money budgeted for it. So they have heard these, these concerns, they have acknowledged them, but um, it really comes down to the funding, it seems. Yeah, uh, it's. I mean, you have to be in compliance with the ADA. I mean, there's no there's no sort of wiggle room around compliance with the ADA, um, and and uh, we do have Office of Disability Rights under our um, under this committee, so we will reach out to Office of Disability Rights as well in regards to making sure that this is a a priority. I mean, there's nothing you can do to get around not having. Uh, this is this is it's not only federal law. Um, but it is it, it must be sort of adhered to. So it, it, it poses a huge issue, no matter where where the cafeteria is. So I want I want to make sure that's clear. Um, we do have some follow up questions about the small capital pro- budget project uh, for that. Um, the small the small capital projects budget is where we would have to get where we would need the funding to be. Um, and so we're going to ask some specific questions to make sure an elevator improve HVAC system included in that lump sum. We just don't know the details of that yet. So that's what I'm going to be unpacking um, with DGS uh, uh, as we go throughout this budget process. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and again, thank you both for your for your advocacy and your testimony. Thank you for being phenomenal teachers and choosing to volunteer to also be leaders uh, in addition to your teaching. Um, and I'll be our team will be following up with you. We appreciate thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. All right, I know we have a number of Jackson Reed students. Um, so, Parker, did you have any questions for the last panel? Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. You I, know, I know we have a number of Jackson Reed students. So, if you are here, Jackson Reed students, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. We're going to start asking you to um, to promote to panelists and unmute yourselves. Uh, Daniel, I see you are here uh, for Jackson Reed, um, so you can unmute and you can begin your tes- testimony and then we'll be uh, going in uh, asking everyone else we see. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Lewis and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dan Iwanek. I am a Ward 5 DC resident. I am the theater teacher at Jackson Reed High School and recently named the Performing Arts Teacher of the Year by DCPS. I am also proud to serve as the director of our spring musical Into the Woods and our fall play And Then There Were None, as well as the sponsor for our stage crew. Through classes and after school programs, I've worked with over half the student body here at Jackson Reed. I've been lucky enough to work with Tony Award winning and Oscar nominated designers, Broadway performers and internationally renowned artists, experience that I'm able to share with my students. But working in her auditorium has been the most mentally taxing, physically exhausting, and stress-inducing experience of my entire career. I've worked with literal opera divas with less issues than this space. Um, We are asking that the committee allocate $550,000 in the 2024 Department of General Services budget to support the assessment and repairs of the Jackson Reed Auditorium to ensure it is fully functional as originally intended. Uh, During my time here, I've been extremely proud of our work at our theater program. We won the Best Musical for the Cappies Award for our production of Hair. Our production of Rent was featured in Idina Menzel's documentary, Which Way to the Stage, and several of our students have been able to perform with Lin-Manuel Miranda for the Kennedy Center Honors. During the pandemic, they wrote six original musicals that were staged and performed outdoors entirely by our students. You really haven't experienced the desperation for live theater until you've heard teenagers belting out Bohemian Rhapsody on a 90-degree day Um, on top of a concrete slab. Um, Ultimately, our program strives to let our students see, hear, and experience the stories that they want to tell. When I began teaching at Jackson Reed, then Wilson High School, many problems with the space already existed. The auditorium with The auditorium was poorly designed, unfinished, and outfitted with obsolete equipment. As an example, the theater was installed with windows that had broken shades. If we have a performance during the day or during a late night soccer game, we have to block out the windows with plywood from the sun um, or the stadium lights. Also, in my first few months, a projection screen broke and was unable to be pulled back up again. Almost 10 years later, it is still hanging there. 
Um, if I go through the entire list of issues, I would be here all day, but I've done it many, 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 many times before, and I keep getting redirected over and over and over again with no solutions. Um, we are not the only group that depends on this space. Our yearly homecoming talent show, uh, which is a fan favorite, usually takes place in the fall. The Chinese department has invited artists from Beijing Opera to perform for our students. Our music department performs their band, jazz, orchestra, and choir concerts there. Our library team has hosted authors and guest speakers in the space, and once a year, our forensics classes investigate a murder that their teacher stages in the back of the auditorium. Um, but we've been unable to do any of these things for our students um, in the auditorium this year. Um, I'm familiar with defunding the arts, but this seems more sinister. We completely fund ourselves, so by allowing the auditorium to deteriorate by the powers that be, it feels like we're being slowly strangled out rather than a clean cut. Uh, we have three recommendations. First, we are asking that the committee allocate $550,000 in the DGS budget to support the assessment and repairs of the Jackson Reed Auditorium to ensure it is fully functional as originally intended. Specific repairs should include the space and seating, electrical systems, walls, floors, sound systems, lighting systems, lifts, AV systems, and other equipment and furnishings. Next, we ask that DGS be required to communicate with um, and issue quarterly reports to a Jackson Reed um, high appointed um, advisory board. Finally, we ask that the committee require DGS to develop and share comprehensive maintenance and leasing plans to ensure that the auditorium remains in excellent condition for Jackson Reed and community to use for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I'll definitely have some questions for you. Uh, at the end of uh, this panel with some of your uh, amazing students. Thank you. <laughs> um, next up, we have uh, Morgan. And I wanna know, uh, council member Matt Fruman is here from Ward 3, your council member, and he is here uh, listening as well. Morgan, you can unmute yourself and begin testimony. Bo, if you're here, you can unmute and begin your testimony. Hello. Um, good morning, good morning council, council members and Chairwoman Lewis George. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify today. My name is B. Gumbiner, and I am a Ward 3 resident and a junior in Jackson Reed High School. I work with Young Women's Project as a youth advocate, lead an environmental club, and participate in theater. I plan to attend college post-graduation and major in environmental studies. I am here today to ask the committee to allocate $550,000 in the FY 2024 Department of General Services budget in order to support the assessment and repairs of the Jackson Reed Auditorium, to ensure it is fully functional as was originally designed. This is currently my third year participating in theater at Jackson Reed High School. Last year, we did a production of Les Miserables, an incredibly enjoyable experience for myself and for my classmates. Theater for many of us is a very crucial part of our lives, a chance to make friends, to socialize and to learn new skills and escape the monogamy of our boring everyday lives. Despite this passion and enjoyment, there's one thing holding us back, our theater. Last year, due to sound system issues, the audience had trouble hearing us over the band. Sometimes the microphones worked, but they frequently cut in and out. The sound system is a major issue, but it's not our only problem. When it rains, water leaks through the roof, causing further equipment damage and a safety hazard to performers. As during a rehearsal last year, a leak in the roof caused me to lose my balance and slip. All I want is the opportunity to perform, but it's being stripped away from me due to the continued hesitancy to fix the auditorium. In order to work around the troubled space, we have moved our current production of Into the Woods to the Black Box Theater, which is a small cramped black box room in our school. To work with the new space, the ensemble of the show is significantly smaller than it could be if we use the auditorium, thus denying a portion of students from exploring their passion. The impacts of the issues with the auditorium extend far beyond the theater. Jackson Reed has a significantly large student body. Thus, for important class meetings, uh, we gather in the auditorium as it's the only space large enough to hold our entire grade. 
However, the projectors don't function properly, causing barriers to communication between administration and the student body. Beyond even the school, theater events are a part of our community. I know some of you in the audience were present for our production last year, and I hope you've seen the state it's in. This is a plea not just for our sake, but for the community. Thus, it is imperative that the funds be allotted towards the restoration of our auditorium. When this body is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on charter schools, it is leaving behind public schools. It's leaving behind our experiences, our education, and our future. Thank you for considering our request, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. I will have some questions for you at the end of the panel. Next up, we have Sarah. Sherlinda, if I didn't say it right, you can just correct me and say your name. You said it right. Hello. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Lewis, George, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sara Sherlinder, and I'm a Ward 3 with DC resident. I'm a senior at Jackson Reed High School, co-leader of the Jewish Student Union, a participant in the student-to-student -student program of the Jewish Community Relations Council, a youth advocate for the Young Women's Project, and a member of Jackson Reed's drama team. Right now, we are rehearsing for a performance of Into the Woods in May. I plan on attending Spelman College in the fall and studying sociology and anthropology to become a social worker and a therapist. I'm here today to testify on the repairs needed in the Jackson Reed Auditorium, which is currently unstable for theater productions. We are asking, committee, we are asking the committee to allocate uh, a $350,000 in theater productions. We're asking the committee to allocate uh, in, the D, in the DGS budget to ongoing equipment failures and space problems we are dealing with. Um, theater is a second home to me, a safe space to express myself while being surrounded by a loving community of peers. In 2019, the spring musical Matilda was the first time I set foot on stage at Jackson Reed. About 50 or more students participated. We performed for at least 200 people. When I first performed, on stage, I was so nervous. However, after that performance, I realized that the beauty of theater is the ability to work on a story for about two months and then show it to hundreds of the community. The theater has introduced me to lifelong friends and a useful skill such as public speaking. <laughs> um, last year in 2020, in, 2000, in 2022, sorry, the spring musical was Les Mis. While we were practicing, one day there was a storm. The ceiling started to leak on stage. As one would suspect, the water can be dangerous, especially if you're dancing. Um, another time during Les Mis, the sound system started to glitch and the audience couldn't hear anything. The stage crew were running around trying to fix the problem and find the problem. It created a ton of stress on the stage crew and onto the, perform onto the performers because we couldn't hear our cues to go on stage and our promoters. Um, this year, when a few friends and I found out that we weren't using the auditorium, we wondered if fundraising could help. Well, later we found out that even though Jackson Reed um, is responsible for the space, we do not control or have the authority to fix it. We are not allowed to raise funds. DCPS doesn't fund it. We as students want to help, but we don't know where to start. The limited space that we are now having in the black box, in the black box will exclude many students from this community. Um, Though it does not seem like a, the biggest difference, about 70 students auditioned to be in musicals um, because involvement in the school commu community is essential to have like a social life and being friends with peers. But the limited space, only 40 students can participate now in the musicals because of the black box being so small. Um, thank you so much for your time and consideration and I hope you have a lovely Thank you so much for your testimony. And I have some questions for you all uh, at the end of this panel. Um, next up is Isabel Posner Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Can you turn your volume up? Do it from Peace Computer. Oh, yeah, absolutely.
Okay. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, good morning. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Isabel Posner Brown, and I am a proud product of DCPS, having gone through Horseman Elementary School and um, Hardy Middle School, and then now I'm at Jackson Reed. I am a soccer player and member of the newspaper staff, and I am also a avid theater lover. Right now, we are in production for Into the Woods, and I asked to testify before you today to urge you to consider the much needed repairs to the Jackson Reed Auditorium. Last year, being part of the spring musical production of Les Mis was the highlight of my year. I met so many new friends. I felt part of the community. And I was so proud to be part of a show that just looked and felt so professional. And that was in large part due to the enormous space which we performed it on. But this year, due to serious equipment challenges, we are performing all of our productions in the Black Box Theater. And the Black Box is a small theater that seats far less than 200 people, as opposed to our very large auditorium. And due to the size limitations, the cast has to be smaller, limiting opportunities for all to participate. The point of high school theater is not only to be a good quality show, but to give as many people possible an opportunity to perform. And last year, nobody was cut from our production of Les Mis. And this year, because of the space that we are in, there is no choice when we have so many people auditioning, but to cut people because it's a safety hazard. Additionally, the space means fewer community members can see our shows. In the fall production, my uncle was turned away at the door because we had to turn away 150 people. Um, and my grandmother, an almost 80 year old woman, was forced to stand in line for an hour to make sure she got a seat to see the showing. And so they are both DC residents and the Jackson Reed Theater Department has a great reputation at our school and within the community and it serves as an opportunity to bring neighborhood together. But operating in a smaller space, we are taking away an important part of this community. Not only that, but for our spring production in order to combat the lack of space, we are putting on around eight shows, which is exhausting for all members of cast and crew and anyone involved in the production. Jackson Reed is an important part of the DC community and we asked the committee to consider allocating $550,000 to the DGS budget to make sure that next year we can make full use of our auditorium and continue to showcase the amazing amounts of talent that we have here. Thank you for your time, have a good day. Thank you, Isabel, for your, for your testimony. I'm gonna answer questions at the end of this panel. Um, next up, we have Simon Holland, student at Jackson Reed High School. I don't see Simon at the moment. We're going to go, um, actually, sorry, Luther, Luther Oy, a student at Jackson Reed High School. Luther, if you're here, you can unmute yourself. With your panelists, I, I just if you make an unmute, you can unmute yourself. Okay. I, I just heard you faintly, so you have to turn up the volume a lot. Hi, I'm going to use these here. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Hello. Oh, now this is working. Okay. Okay. Good morning, Chair Lewis George and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Luther Hoy, and I, and I am a junior at Jackson Reed High School, and I live in Ward 3. I'm heavily involved with theater as the head of the ensemble and a participant in the stage crew. Currently, I'm spending my afternoons at rehearsal for the upcoming musical Into the Woods. While I hope to attend College for Public Policy and Government, 
Theater has given me a space to enhance vital performance skills, uh, public speaking, and creative thinking. I'm here today to testify on the repairs needed for the Jackson Reed Auditorium, which is currently unusable for theater productions, forcing us to perform in the rundown, much smaller black box. We are asking the committee to allocate $550,000 in the DGS budget to address ongoing equipment failures and space problems we are dealing with. I came to Jackson Reed with no prior experience or knowledge of theater. I never imagined myself being so heavily involved in it. However, it was the community that drew me in and made me continue to participate in theater all year round. I've met the kindest, most welcoming people in the theater that I've formed everlasting friendships and communications with. One of the best parts of these productions last year in the auditorium was that there was no fear of rejection. Everyone was able to perform in the show with such a large theater. Participating in the ensemble of Les Mis was one of the best couple months of my life, even if my role would be considered minimal to the onlooker. In reality, the ensemble of a show is the most important group that makes these high scale productions come together and generate the most community building. This year came with a huge change. Moving into a much smaller performing stage, cast sizes had to be cut down. This created a much more competitive environment and eliminated the welcoming community building theater I knew about at the beginning of my sophomore year. Furthermore, performing in a smaller space cut cuts down on the number of people who are in an ensemble, which, as I said before, is the most important group of people in a show. Working, working in a smaller environment has left us feeling stressed, overwhelmed, angry, and quite frankly, unfriendly. I miss the culture we had when new to Theater Luther was able to join with no difficulty and have a substantial role. I miss the opportunity to work in a larger, much more collaborative environment. And most of all, I miss the ensemble. Fixing the auditorium would not only give the school a much needed technological upgrade, but it would also bring back the theater pride that I, lo that I love and, and dearly miss. As the head of the representative of the ensemble at Jackson Reed High School, I call upon DGS to finally give Jackson Reed Theater the funding we deserve and have asked for for so long. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is Luther there with you all? Oh, Luther, you just, okay. We'll be missing. Okay, I think that's the entire first panel from, from Jackson Reed. Um, first of all, I'm going to let Councilman Fermi go first with a question, um, but I do want to say a few words. I want to thank um, uh, the performing arts uh, teacher, Daniel. Um, I think Into the Woods is going to be a great production. Um, and so I'm going to say first and foremost, good luck to all of you in the show. Um, I remember really my first DCBS musical, which was Oklahoma. Uh, those are fond memories for me. Uh, I remember being so a part of the ensemble, dance, and everything else. And so enjoying every single moment. Um, they will always be fond memories. And uh, your friends you make uh, within this will be your friends for a lifetime. I can attest to that. Um, I will be following up with EGS uh, with uh, questions that you all have posed. Um, but Council Member Ruben, who is a year three council member, um, uh, which Jackson Reed is located in, um, he's a huge advocate uh, for Jackson Reed High School, especially students and teachers. I'm going to give him an opportunity first to ask you all questions, um, and then I may follow up with some additional questions after that. Uh, so, Councilman Ruben, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson Lewis George. I, I don't know if folks on the Jackson Reed panel can can see the painting behind me, which is a, a kind of bird's eye view of Jackson Reed that my wife did, um, and I I get lots of compliments about it. Um, and we had children at what was then called Wilson for ten plus years. Uh, I have been to a lot of musicals um, and have loved every one of them. And one, um, and I've watched how 
engagement in theater has been transformative for dozens of kids over the years. Uh, friends of our children who got engaged in it and um, it really gave them a vehicle. And they may, they may, some of them went on to stay in theater into their, what are now their careers, but others of them just had the kind of rocket fuel from that experience that helped propel them to success at high school and and then onward into college and, and career. I think it was um, Isabel who, who almost had the trifecta of soccer, the beacon, and theater. And I, I, I put soccer in sports and sports and crew is another one of those. And those are the things that turn out to be lifelines for kids and in an environment of 2,200 kids under the school, having a way to connect in small groups and have experiences together is really something very, very special. I don't know if the 24 hour plays are a thing that still happens. Um, the, my first 24 hour play, I, I need to come. Somebody needs to tell me when the next 24 hour play is. Um, I was. Uh, the first 24 hour play I saw, I was stunned <laughs> uh, because it's a window into what's on the minds of 16, 17 and 18 year olds and uh, very bracing. It makes you remember when you were 16, 17 or 18 and what was on your minds. Uh, that, but really another one of those super great things that happens at the school through the theater. Um, uh, Mr. Awanik, how, how would I, how do I pronounce it? Iwanik. Iwanik. Uh, you come in a, a broad tradition. Uh, I, I was there when Harriet Bronstein played the role that you played, and she had struggles around the auditorium. Karen Harris is a dear old friend and has been talking about the needs in the auditorium for a long time. And now the torch gets passed to you. And your testimony of talking about just the level of frustration. I love the line that you've worked with opera divas, and this is harder than that. <laughs> um, and so really, really want to work together to get this taken care of once and for all. Uh, there, there have been issues broadly about the roof. And one of the things that people talk about is that there's challenges with the sound system and then the the sound system gets fixed and then the roof leaks again and damages the sound system. And so we do need to uh, get that, get the roof fundamentally taken care of. My understanding is that the roof is back to be for a major repair coming up soon. Is that your understanding as well? Um, from what I've heard uh, very recently, yes, that there should be making some repairs to the roof soon. Um, so we need to make sure that that those are complete, that it kind of completes the shell of the theater so that the repairs on the inside can be made and then stay. Uh, you know, one of the things that you referred to was a leasing policy, I think. And I'm curious wh how what you're thinking about that. I, I will tell you that I played a role on uh, the Wilson Management Corporation years ago, and we rent we managed rentals of the field and the theater and some other things. And you don't want to compromise access for the school to any of those facilities. But on the other hand, if done right, rental of those facilities can generate income that uh, that could turn the repairs into an investment because there is significant demand outside of the school for the theaters and a will uh, for the theater and a willingness to pay for it. Is that what you were referring to? What were you referring to when you referred to the leasing? Uh, that was one of the things that we refer to. Um, we have in the past like two years, we obviously have not been renting out the auditorium, but before that we were, and it was my understanding at the time that those rentals would be the income from those rentals would be put back into the theater program, but we haven't seen, you know, from the day 
we've started, we haven't seen any repairs um, or any investment from those, even though we've had, you know, we have churches that would be here week after week investing, you know, I think like $20,000 or something close to that amount of money to just be in those spaces. But there's been literally no investment. And even I think part of what we're talking about with the lease agreement is that some of these um, groups would come in and rent the space and then things would either go missing or would break. And there was, you know, no back and forth about like who is going to fix. I think only once did that ever happen. Um, but there wasn't any sort of, you know, collateral or anything there to help us out. And have those rentals been happening in the last couple of years or the or since COVID, have they been suspended? Yeah, since COVID. In fact, um, most of them have been suspended since the change over between the um, who manages the like where the funding goes because right. it used to go directly to the school and then now it, it that has changed. Yeah, and and it's changing again. Uh, there was a law passed about this about how these funds should be managed, and it's it's changing again. So this is a thing that I think again we should work together to make sure that it gets implemented by the city so that the rental funds, some portion of them, not every dollar would flow back into the school. Um, but also in thinking about that, if you think that you're talking about a half a million dollar investment to uh, fix the theater, I don't know how long it would take for that to be repaid in rentals. I don't want to think about it as a business investment because it's way more about the incredible testimony of the students today about what it means in the lives of our students. But it also has an economic but that can be now to get this done and get this done soon. So I think that I had five minutes and I've gone significantly over. If there's another opportunity for questions, I may come back with more. But I really, really want to thank you all for your testimony. I actually think I've been a part of this. And, you know, uh, you talked about the flaws in the design. I was present at the design. And we brought in experts from the local theaters who happened to be, you know, what was then called Wilson Parents and tried as much as we could to get to have an impact on it. And the, the theater, you know, there are challenges with it, but it is also breathtakingly beautiful. So if we can make it work, we can, it would really be great. Um, uh, but we got to get this thing right once and for all. And, and in all of that time, I don't think I've seen a thing like what I'm seeing today, which is yourself and a bunch of students coming forward and making the case. And that is very, you should feel very, very good about the impact that you are having and we're gonna work hard for you. One last thing for Councilwoman, uh, for Chair, Chairperson Lewis George, you know, when they, when folks talked about the lines to go to get into the shows, I'll just say, and I'll plant a seed that um, when I was a candidate, I went and those long lines where people are stuck out there forever is not such a bad thing when you go, you know, from one end of the line saying hello to people at the back of the line. But, but it's a it's a testament to the power that the theater has as a community building institution, which is enormous and has been for as long as I've been associated with the school. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you, Councilman Truman. Um, I have questions for the students. Um, and, and Elijah, I'm starting with you because you identified yourself as workforce and workforce based arts. <laughs> um, my question What is your role in Into the Woods? What role do you play in, in Into the Woods? And how would uh, your um, performance, how would your experience be better uh, if? Uh, the funding was put into this budget to, uh, to to make the changes that you would like to see um, to the auditorium. You can unmute, Mark, you're first. No, Elijah, you're first. Sorry, I thought it was a more broad question. So the same, how would our experience with this current session be different? Yeah, and what role do you play? What role are you playing in Into the Woods? So I'm uh, part of this thing, 
basically what it's called the floor creep. And basically, we're not in the like main show, but we're basically doing the little show before. Okay, so like we'll be in the lobby area and we'll interact with the audience and like maybe selling concessions and stuff. But yeah, we're basically preparing the audience uh, to, because since due to the black box, we were trying to be innovative and take advantage of the closer space to actually have some yeah. audience interaction in the show. So what the floor troop is doing is we're uh, seeing who's into the interaction and who's not to prepare them for the experience. Okay. And uh, so the floor troop is actually some, somewhat of a effect of the, uh, the problems in the auditorium because without, if the auditorium is fully functional, we might not even exist. I might not have a part, but that's not the point. The point is that yeah. <laughs> You'd rather have the auditorium than the floor troop because it just right. allows right. us not just have an ensemble role, which is great, and a lot more people who are different than have an ensemble role. And we'd be able to right. put on probably a more professional scene. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elijah. I appreciate that. Um, whoever wants to go next, you all can, you can choose. I'm you, and I want to hear from everyone. Um, hi. So, same question, correct? Yes. So, um, uh, what role you, what role you, you you're going to, you're playing in Into the Woods? Yes. Okay. And, so, yeah. Um, okay. So, hi, I'm playing the giant. Um, and into the watch, so you'll be hearing my voice. It'll be very scary. <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing is like I'm a I'm a giant and I'm in ensemble and I'm in the floor troop. Um, I believe this. Your second question was how it would be different if you were in the auditorium. Yeah, how your experience and performance um, would be better if you I were in the auditorium. I think thing is the floor troop is an essential to interact with the audience. Um, well, that too. <laughs> um, I think one thing is like, because of the floor troop, um, because we can't have everybody on stage at the same time, because there's not the big, there's not really like, it's a, it's like a square in the middle of a room. Mm -hmm. So I think the floor troop would have been more of like the ensemble part if we had more room, just because of a safety hazard of having people on stage at the same time. Um, but I don't know. I think the interactive of the audience would there would be more of an audience to interact with. That was like the biggest yeah. takeaway because there can only be we're gonna have a band in our black box somehow, so it's gonna be like section by section. So really, only thirty people, thirty audience, forty audience members can even come, which is why we're having it eight times. So I think if it was in the auditorium, there'd be more people interact, more opportunities to have like it. Floor trips like improv. Um, Kind of, so mm -hmm. like it would be kind of more fun to randomly pick random people. Um, and then yeah. for like ensemble, it would just be more reactions, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, <laughs> I'm Cinder's Moose Understudy, and I'm also in Fletcher Troop and Ensemble, kind of the whole jam. Um, and I mean, I think that, I mean, Considering that we're in the black box, I'm up with, especially Mr. Iwanek, how we've, the show has been put on. So I think it's nice that there's not a lot to be able to say that I think the show would be better. I think the show would be different. Mm -hmm. And I think that being able to put it on a stage, we'd be able to tell the intricate details a little better of the specific set designs and stuff because we could have mm -hmm. set changes, which we can't have because we are in a room where everyone's in there and we can't change the set. But I don't necessarily agree that the show would, or not agree, but like, I mean, I think I'm really proud that I'm able to say that the show would not necessarily be better, that it would just be different. I love that answer, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
I can hear you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I am in the ensemble. More specifically, I am playing a fox. And um, I'm also the head of the ensemble, the representative of the ensemble. And that means that if someone in the ensemble has some sort of complaint or worry about rehearsal, I'm the person to talk to uh, when it comes to talking to Mr. Iwanek. And I think Izzy said this really well, I'm really happy that there is still able to have an ensemble in the black box and it's impressive, but, and it's impressive because there is absolutely no space for that to be possible. And when I was in Les Mis, there was just so much more for me to do when I was in part of the ensemble. It was just so, so much more of a ensemble welcoming environment to be on the big stage. And, you know, right now, like uh, in, in the fall, we did the show and then there were none. And the ensemble for that show was pretty much basically off stage for the entire time because there really isn't any space on stage for them to be participating in it. And so there's just so much difficulties with trying to incorporate the ensemble into a black box. Thank you, I appreciate that. Hi, um, I am also in the ensemble. I play a chipmunk. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think with the space, well, I think Mr. Iwanek has a very good vision to make sure that we can fit as many people and as many audience members. The space is still very limiting, limiting, because we obviously we can't all stay. We can't all be on stage or be in such a cramped area. Uh, so I think definitely if we were using the auditorium, there would be a lot more ensemble involvement and probably a larger ensemble. Uh, just because, um, as was aforementioned, uh, some people did have to get cut because space restraints. Thank you. I, I appreciate all of your um, responses. Um, and again, I wish you all the best of luck on your show. Um, I will be uh, working with uh, Councilmember Fruman to try to find this funding in the budget. Um, I appreciate your advocacy very much so. And like I said, my first production as a DCPS student was uh, the ensemble for Oklahoma. Um, we spent a lot of days and nights together. I remember every moment of it. So enjoy every moment of it. It'll be memories that last for a lifetime and friendships that will last um, for a lifetime. So, so just enjoy every second of it because uh, it goes so quickly and so fast. Um, but I appreciate all your advocacy. And I'll say, uh, this isn't the first time Jackson Reed students have advocated to me. The first time was actually, we were uh, Jackson Reed, my first year as a council member, advocated for librarians uh, to find funding. And we were able to find funding for librarians in the budget. We advocated around uh, changing the name for Jackson Reed and the students showed up, including the newspaper. Uh, and we were able to reach a really great compromise and make sure we honor uh, both uh, Mr. Reed and, and Edna Jackson. Um, and so this is your third time coming. You're saying we need this money for theater. Uh, so um, hopefully we are gonna be able to uh, take your advocacy once again um, and make this happen. So thank you again. Good luck to you all on your show. Um, thank you so so much, Mr. Iwanek. And um, I'm gonna ask Councilman Fruman if he has any more questions um, and then we will uh, end this panel. Councilman Fruman, any last questions? No, I think we thank you very much. I think we've covered it. Um, see you okay. all at Into the Woods. Great. Thank you thank so you much. Everybody. All right. In our last uh, panel, we will have, uh, I think, two additional witnesses. Um, and if, you, if you're here now and haven't had the chance to speak yet, Please use the raise hand feature and we'll promote you to share your testimony as well. And a reminder, if you have not submitted your written testimony, to please submit your written testimony to facilities at dccouncil.gov uh, so that it can be included in the record.
All right, I see Maya Walker, Black Swan Academy. Hello, I'm Chairperson Lewis. Hi. Heard on submitting my testimony. I will do that very soon. Apologies on the delay in getting that to you. Um, my name is Maya Walker and I am the advocacy and organizing manager at Black Swan Academy. Black Swan Academy is a youth-led organization that creates a pipeline of youth leaders that are committed to improving themselves as well as their communities. Black Swan Academy is committed to the safety, empowerment, and creativity of Black youth in DC. We understand that so much of this relies on student school environments. So today I am here to urge the council to have stronger oversight of, D of DGS and also demand that equitable funding be funneled into schools that are in severe need of repairs. In creating Black Swan Academy's 2023 Black Youth Agenda, youth have specifically named the following demands. One, more funding and training for deep cleaning. Two, more funding um, and timely repairs in schools. Three, expand funding to better support young people with emergency needs like cleaning products, toiletries, food, and clothes. Four, personal hygiene vending machines at community schools. And five, clear water in fountains and water bottle fillers. Um, I think it's important to note that most of the current open work order requests for DC public school buildings involve interior services, including locks and doors, HVAC services, and plumbing. Youth have voiced similar concerns in naming that many of the doors on the bathroom stalls and building exterior do not lock, sinks and toilets are falling out of the walls, and flooding is not addressed in a timely manner. According to the DC auditor's report, it takes DGS on average of 55 days to complete work orders. And over 60% of those high priority work orders, which are issues that present a potential health or safety risk are not completed within the mandatory 10 days. Furthermore, basic hygiene products like soap and toilet paper are not provided or restocked in a timely manner. You've also mentioned extreme hot or cold temperatures in classrooms that cause nosebleeds or trigger asthma attacks and make it difficult to focus on schoolwork. They also expressed concerns about finding rat droppings in the lockers and classrooms. Generally, students expressed a desire for safe and comfortable learning environments for them to be at their best academically and, um, and at a minimum that requires that schools are safe and clean and fixed. While any one of these would be enough to make an adult uncomfortable, this issue is compounded for youth who are expected to still spend a full eight hour day at school through these conditions. Youth further highlight the problems with poor facilities and the lack of sanitation in schools in stating that they are often forced to hold themselves through the full eight hour day and refuse to go to the bathrooms at schools. Others name that they, that they often will just leave school altogether and go home to use the restroom. In these instances, it's not always guaranteed that a student would be compelled to return to school after. Kids should be in school and instead they're missing class to take care of their basic and bodily functions. Recently, we've seen an uptick in programs that support getting menstrual, menstrual products to excuse me, menstrual products to students. Unfortunately, this continues to be an unmet need for students. Young people have specifically named that their school now has transitioned to having vending machines with tampons and pads in them. However, they are not free. Instead, they have to pay anywhere from 50 to 75 cents to access these product, products. In a cashless world and a city with major economic inequalities, this is truly not feasible means to addressing the larger problems around access to period products, let alone that the students have tried paying for these products and the machines are empty. Continuing on, students are often instructed to go see staff to receive these products and have named multiple times various difficulties with finding those staff and um, knowing where they are and actually the staff member being able to have those products on hand. Overall, the DC population, DCPS school population consists of predominantly Black and Latin A students. Um, and the majority of DGS open work orders are in wards four, five, seven, and eight, where many schools have a high population of students of color. Point blank, Black and Brown students in DC are more likely to be sub subjected to poor school conditions. Further exemplifying these in, in, inequities is the reality that these are the same schools that are often last to receive updates and modernization. Even for schools that are receiving these moder modernizations, DGS is not managing the upkeep in a way that will allow for these moder modernization efforts to last. There are schools that haven't been touched in decades that are in similar state of despair to those were, that were modified in the last six to eight years. This is unacceptable. And so to end it out, I would just like to say that I think there is an urgent need to fund the immediate repairs and address all uncompleted work orders in schools that are in wards four, five, seven, and eight. I'm also urging the council to shift money away from modernizing affluent schools until DGS shows a track record in which they are in a place to manage these updates. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Um, thank you so much for that detailed testimony, uh, I think powerful testimony that spoke to a number of issues, especially highlighting the equity piece um, of, of what happens when uh, certain, you know, schools that have uh, certain populations of students don't get the repairs they need, the support they need, the learning environments they deserve to learn in, um, which is at the, 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 the center of, of what I was getting from your, from your testimony um, and why it's so important. Um, I want to ask you, uh, because I know Black Swan Academy does a lot of advocacy work and brings students together in, in that regard. Um, you know, what, what do you all as students and what do students feel when you are in unsafe conditions or in schools that are, don't, are not getting the repairs? What does that do to you as a student? What does that do to our students? Um, and uh, how does it impact them both emotionally health-wise, physically, what, what do, what do we, what does that impact to our students? Yeah, and I can definitely say that the hope was to have young folks on the call to be able to talk about it, but they're in school. And so it was just a, a little bit of a scheduling mishap. Um, but we have heard a lot of youth name the concerns just about like, there's a deep desire for them to be in schools. And also, um, I think the impact is that they feel like they don't want to be in schools, um, to not be able to go to the restroom, um, to be, they even named things like the store, the doors on the bathroom stalls don't lock. Um, and then the front doors of the classroom, especially as they see like a lot of the uptick in like gun violence and like school shootings, like not having a front door on your school that locks is like a huge safety concern. And then young folk often, um, I know that there is like a lot of pushback that's received, but young folk often do couple that with the need to be able to have access to their phones. And so it's like, well, wow, anyone can walk up into the building and my phone is locked away in some like locker or office. So if something mm. was to happen, um, I just don't feel safe. Um, They've also named like in terms of when it comes to like menstrual products, um, even something as simple as having like the little um, waste bins in every stall, they don't have that. Right. So there's like in bathrooms where there's no toilet paper and I don't have a place to dispose my thing. What am I supposed to do? Just carry my period products like out in my right. bare hands to the trash can. Um, it's just very unsanitary and it kind of gets into the thing of like, I think we're doing a lot of work to break down or like shift young people away from the narratives of like, oh, like my school is nasty or like these kids are nasty. And it's like, no, this is actually a system that has failed you. And some of the females that are using these period products are doing the best they can to care for themselves with the lack of like infrastructure that is then providing those resources that they actually need, which in my mind are the yeah. basic necessities. Um, yeah. Other things I think just like impact wise is I think that, um, compared to the schools, I was really wanted to focus on the inequity piece in my testimony. And so I'm glad that you were able to pull that out. But I think just the acknowledgement that not all schools are like this. And so like there is something in the water or like, this is like, we'll just call it what it is, systemic racism that is like not providing for these students in the ways that they need to be. And seeing that it's completely opposite in those more affluent schools um, is just wild. Um, and they often name those concerns as well. Yeah. Absolutely, thank I, I I appreciate all those points and, and wholeheartedly agree with you there. Um, also, thank you for speaking about work order issues. Um, I'm also going to be starting questions later today with Director Hunter on DGS work order backlog and HVAC issues. Um, we've got to do better, and so I'm glad you spoke out today about the impacts of school facilities impacting students' learning environment and mental health. Um, there is a bill from my colleague, uh, Councilmember Brooke Pinto, or two council member about access to period products. Um, and my office is working with her team uh, to get the vending machines working properly, um, but also noting some of the facilities issues like not having them in the stalls also is a barrier um, and, and also uh, you know, impacts um, our, our students in a very uh, great way. So um, I appreciate your testimony. I'm gonna turn to my uh, colleague, council member Matt Fruman and ask if he has any uh, questions, and I'm also going to ask if there's any other uh, individuals who want to testify and have not done so, please raise your hand as this will be uh, our last panel. Uh, Councilmember Fruman, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, less a question, more an observation. I, I, I think, Ms. Walker, it's really, really important that we close out the testimony if there are others that 
that's great. But um, with your testimony that goes to uh, a lot of focus just now on one theater, which is very, very important to me, um, but the issues are very broad. And there is, on one level, the issue is we need to have schools that operate properly and that are fully serving our kids. On another level, I think it goes to what you, some of what you were talking about in response to what you're hearing from kids. And that is everything we do sends a message to our kids. They're watching really closely. They see, they know who cares and they know who doesn't care. And they know when they're being respected and they know when they're not being respected. And so in, in one way, we build these beautiful schools and that sends a message to our kids. And it's a good message if, uh, when we do that. On the other hand, we let them break down so that the sink doesn't work or the toilet doesn't work. And that sends a different message. And we need to be sending a message at every level to our kids that we care and we're in their corner if we don't want them to go off the rails, frankly. And so it's it, it may seem odd to think of bathroom repairs as a public safety issue, but they are because they speak to our kids. So, you know, really grateful for the work that you do and your testimony today. And I hope that we as a city can take that to heart, that, um, that we need to make these places work and we need to send the message that we care. We need to send a message of equity. Uh, there is also, you know, there is all of that dimension to it. And then there is also yet another dimension, which even if you're a person who doesn't care about kids, and I hope there aren't many of them, but uh, if all you care about is dollars, we've spent billions of dollars. And then if we don't maintain it, maintain those, that investment, we're just washing those dollars down the drain. So even if the, at every level, the thing that you are talking about is super important and I hopeful, hopefully we can take it to heart and be effective on this. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much, Councilmember Freeman, uh, for, for closing out this public witness testimony on that note. And, and thank you, Maya, your testimony really was a great closeout. Uh, to the public witness uh, and everything that needs to be considered and really what's at stake uh, when we don't take care of our facilities. Um, and so I know uh, DGS is listening in and, and Director Hunter is listening in and I, 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 I hope that they will include this at the center uh, of the work uh, that they are doing. Um, so thank you to all of our public witnesses today. Um, witnesses are again reminded to send a written copy of their remarks to facilities at dccouncil.gov so that it may be included in the record. All testimony and pre-hearing documents are available on my website at janicewardford.com uh, backslash Dropbox. Uh, the record for this hearing closes in five business days at 5 p.m. on Thursday, April 13th. Uh, we will resume this hearing at 3 p.m. today, where we will hear from our government uh, witnesses, including uh, Director uh, Hunter of DGS, uh, Acting Director Hunter of DGS, uh, and his team. Um, and thank you to all of my colleagues for listening and engaging with our public witnesses. Um, and I will see you all at 3 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>